Welcome to something to wrestle with. Welcome to wrestle with. Bruce Pritchard. Bruce Pritchard. Well, you know. That's not a rib. She pooed it. She pooed it. What a rib. No, you have a There's no box of gimmicks. Rumor and innuendo. I don't deal in rumor and innuendo. It, it, it. Was he there? I was there. I don't give a shit. <laughs> Fuck you. Fuck you, Bruce. I love you. Double cheeseburger. Double cheese. Double mayo. Double onion, motherfucker. Dig it. Bruce Pritchard. So let's keep it moving here and uh, let's talk about what's next uh, Undertaker and Mankind. It's our main event. This is the first ever Buried Alive match. We're finally here. What a set we've got. They've built a dirt mound cemetery behind the ringside seats on the arena floor. So as the participants are coming to the ring that night, there's this huge mound of dirt right there with the tombstone and the whole deal. Meltzer would say, although the ending was goofy, the match itself was really good effort by both. Mankind took lots of crazy bumps into the guardrail, over the guardrail, onto the floor and on the steps. Undertaker actually did a great plancha and must be the biggest guy to ever try such a stunt. This was worked similarly to a lot of recent ECW main events with crazy bumps and brawling, but the work itself wasn't as sloppy. Undertaker took a hard chair shot to the face from mankind after no selling an earned shot by Paul bear undertaker threw him on the ring steps a few times and finally hit the tombstone. Undertaker carried him to the cemetery, but mankind recovered and got the mandible claw on undertaker got out and choke slam mankind into the dirt for the victory and started burying him afterwards. As the ref tried to stop undertaker from throwing dirt on him, he twice threw the ref off the cemetery. Finally, Terry Gordy showed up under a mask with a shovel and hit undertaker with a shovel, pulled mankind out of the grave and put the undertaker into the grave. Several heels began bearing the undertaker until the thunder and lightning in the arena and the carry finish three quarters of a star. So let's sort of set the stage. The finish of the match is not a submission. It's not a one, two, three. We got to get the lifeless body into this hole. That's pre dug in this grave, if you will. And now we've got all this dirt and we're going to start shoveling it. And we're going to bury a guy alive when the executioner shows up, AKA Terry Gordy under a hood, he breaks the shovel over the undertaker, which is a hell of a visual. And now with a little bit of help from all the other heels, the undertaker's buried. This is a scene that we saw maybe a different version of at an old Royal rumble casket match with Yokozuna where it feels like all the heels are there. Well, that whole routine is happening again, but this time not with a coffin or a casket, but with a grave and the carry finish is once he's dead and gone, wink, wink, lightning happens inside the arena and I'll be damned if a purple glove doesn't burst up through the grass to let us know the undertaker's not dead. Well, no one ever said he's going to be dead. This well, he's been he's dead for years. Alive, he is alive. The, he, he was. He's the dead man, so he's been dead the entire time we've known him. Okay, but you, in particular, had to love the gimmick, the lightning, and the hand. This feels like Bruce Pritchard one hundred and one. Yes, every bit of it. So chat me up. Absolutely loved it. There were so many things about it. You, you, you go back and you look at it, and and again, I the cemetery match was the original idea, which I did love, and I really wanted to do, really fucking bad. Uh, still want to, <laughs> you know. Um, so that part of it was was uh, was what it was. But yes, I, I did. I loved every bit of it. I, I loved the visual of it and the the holy shitness of it, um, and the the unknown and kind of walking that fine line, dangerous part of it. So, to that, 
yes, I, I got to say, I go back and, and reminisce on this. It was uh, just a great display and great execution, no pun intended. You know, Terry Gordy is the executioner. And, you know, I, I don't think that anybody in the audience knew that was Terry Gordy. No. You know, um, or ever would have thought because he had lost so much weight and just didn't resemble Terry Gordy at that point. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, what, what was there not to like? Chat me up about the finish, not the finish of the match, but the whole segment, the idea that God dang, it feels like you guys thought of everything, you know, the lightning, the hand, the set. I'm so glad you said that. Keep going though. Except fuck. It's going to take forever to bury him. We got to move all this dirt over. Send another guy. Send another. Is that what happened? Yeah. And then you notice that, you know, we, we ended up with front loaders and shit like that. Subsequent time. But it, it's a lot faster when someone's not blown up too. And well, there's, there's that. There's that. And for those of you that have ever, uh, or ever ordered 15 yards of dirt to come over to your house, you can spread your sand out and level out your land a little bit and your, your grass and shit like that. You know how hard it is to shovel. And there was a lot more than 15 yards there. I think it was a total of 45 yards. So think about that for a minute. <laughs> um, so yeah, man, it was a lot of people out there to get that dirt in there as well. But the other thing that didn't really didn't, didn't come to light till after, after the fact was you had that headstone that was weighed a lot, a lot, a whole lot. I mean, this is, I want to put in context what we're talking about. This is not something that a couple of guys can just go move for you. No, this is a, you're going to need a machine to move this motherfucker. Yeah. You had to place it with a forklift. Yes. Okay. And it was sitting, but, but you could tump it. Okay. Like, so like a couple of guys could have pushed it over on its side, probably not lift it, but if you had some big, strong motherfuckers, you could probably push it over and add on to that, that it's ground and it was pretty close to the edge. It was, it was probably a foot from the edge. And in that edge is where taker's hand was coming up. So takers coming up through there and there's not a whole lot of support at that point. And it was scary as shit because when they started it at the end of the night, you start like tearing everything down and somebody just moved and that fucking thing started to come like tip over and almost went into the, into the uh, hole. Oh no. So thank God that didn't happen at any time during the match or during the, the burial, because that would have been a really bad scene. Um, a guy would have died. It would have been ugly. Um, but it was, you know, it was pushed back enough, but when they started tearing everything down and they start tearing everything away, the thing's so heavy, you don't think it's going anywhere, but they had torn away everything in front of it now. So you didn't have that, that foot cushion and it was right on the edge where it was supported and somebody just, you know, Oh yeah, man, it's not going anywhere and pushed on it and it started to go. And they're like, Oh shit. And you had to pump it back the other way. So that was one of those that was like, all right, if you notice, you know, on the, the subsequent very live matches, we didn't have, uh, that sturdy of, headstones anymore it was a little scary but that headstone still exists in the uh in the warehouse i've seen in it. the warehouse yeah so very cool listen if you're not going to tell us then i'm just going to play the clip from that nbc magic thing 
You going to tell us anything? No, I'm not. Why not? Because it's magic. Nobody wants to know that. Enjoy it. Have fun with it. I love I love magic. I love to go to Chris Angel. Chris Angel has offered to show me things. No, you, I'm like, no. I don't want to know. I don't want I don't want to sit backstage and see see how it's done. I want to sit out and enjoy it as a spectator. Because I love magic. I love the I love watching someone do it well. And if it's done well, you really shouldn't care. It takes all the fun out of it. Well, if you want to know, go throw it in a Google machine how to perform the famous buried alive trick. Nobody knows how to perform it. Just, Nobody knows how we did it. Just type it in how to perform the famous buried alive trick. Don't yeah, why? Why would you even that's why would you even say that? That's stupid. Don't do that. That's my favorite. Nobody, part. W- nobody knows how to do it like we did it. So my favorite part of this entire thing is a story that Mick Foley told Kenny McIntosh, uh, I guess two years ago where this is not the last show, last match of the night. It's just the last match on the pay-per-view. Remember now, this is the in your house days. So in your house buried alive was only two hours long. And what a jam packed pay-per-view this is. I still think it's a good show. Maybe it's just my nostalgia talking, but (laughs) it's over. The Godwins are going to wrestle the new rockers. And then Shawn Michaels is going to wrestle gold dust, but process what we've just seen. A man died. Didn't die. He was buried alive. He was buried alive. So we assume he's dead now. He's not breathing under the dirt. But maybe he is because all of a sudden there was lightning indoors and a hand burst through, but we're not supposed to worry about that because now here come the new rockers. Leaf Cassidy. It's unbelievable that that is the way it goes. Uh, but that is how it went. And by the way, the observer readers gave it 63.8% thumbs up, 22.1% thumbs down. And 14.1% thumbs in the middle. What say you thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs in the middle. I thought it was thumbs up. Very. Sean comes out on April 7th, 1997 and does a 15 minute promo, which Meltzer called a pretty much shoot interview. He says it was easily the best segment on either show, but it got murdered in the ratings. They said, Sean did a tremendous job getting himself over as a baby face. He says that he and Brett loathe each other, both in wrestling and in real life. He said, Brett didn't just turn a bad guy. Brett was always a bad guy. And then he used his parents, his sister and his kids to get on TV so he could make money. He said, if Brett Hart could make a buck, he'd sell his mother. He said six years ago when he got the IC title and Brett got the WWF belt, he was happy playing second fiddle to Brett. But when it was Brett's turn to play second fiddle, he kicked and scratched every inch of the way. He said, Brett took time off because he thought the WWF and Michaels would collapse while he was gone. But instead, they did the best business they'd done in six years and asked McMahon if that was true or not, and McMahon agreed. And Meltzer says, Reality break, folks. It goes without saying that in the ring, Michaels did a super job in 1996, and he was my pick as wrestler of the year. But let's not rewrite history to say Sean's reign was Hogan-like from a business standpoint because nothing could be further from the truth. TV ratings collapsed in June of 96 on Sean's watch, not Brett's reached all time lows for the rest of the year, but the buy rates fell through his reign. And it was during Sean's reign for the first time in a decade that the WWF and both pay-per-view and TV ratings fell to the number two company in the U S and when it came to the house shows, while the WWF had a strong year in 96, it's best months were in February and March. And who was the champion then? So I do like that. We're at least having a conversation. And we're, we're blurring the lines. I enjoy that. I know that you said maybe Meltzer did, maybe he didn't. Where did you land well, on? Didn't he just say this was the greatest promo ever? While well, he said the other one was too inside and not good. Well, yes. Yeah, exactly. In both sides of his mouth, he speaks. And out of, out of both sides comes lies and just shit made up. But anyway. Sean would go on to say, Michael said that Brett used a rival organization to stab the WWF who made him in the back into upping the money he could get. He then said that Brett couldn't separate wrestling from real life, that he's obsessed with the limelight and the title. And that it used to bother him when fans cheered Brett, but now he realizes fans can cheer who they want. He 
said all the superheroes and role models couldn't live up to it. And he isn't claiming to be a role model. He's only claiming that if you pay to see him wrestle, he'll work harder to give you a good show and harder than anyone else. Ton of inside baseball, but acknowledging where business was and all that in a promo. Do you think that belongs on television? Just your opinion? No, I don't. I really don't. I I don't think that um, Tom Brady's going to get on and cut a promo about how NBC many more viewers there are when he throws a football. Correct. Tiger Woods isn't going to get on and talk about when he swings golf club, how many more people tune in. Right. Uh, I don't think that the general public cares about that. We, we got obsessed with the, Oh, Hey bro, it's a shoot, you know, bro, you got to tell them. I don't think that anyone that watches television has a favorite television show that you watch every week. Right. I don't think that anybody can tell you what their numbers are for the most part, what their ratings are each and every week. The only time the ratings come into play to the average viewer is when their favorite television show gets canceled. And they wonder what happened. Right. Well, hey, there weren't enough people that watched it. (laughs) Yeah. And I think that there are times that the... The Monday Night Wars made people obsessed with the ratings and who won and what have you, and it became a part of a storyline. But it is a storyline that I don't think that the general public, that the general fan, the casual fan, the even the non-casual fan really cares about. That they're not waiting on Tuesday afternoon to wonder, oh my God, what did Raw do last night in the ratings? How many people watched Raw? Did, did more people watch when, when Sean was talking about Brett or when Brett was talking about Sean? Right. Did, did it spike? Nobody cares. Did you enjoy it? Did you feel some emotion and some passion in that promo? Did you care? If you did, great. It was a great promo. If you didn't, okay. Maybe it wasn't so good. Maybe it should have been shorter. So I think that, yeah, I think that the, the inside business – of our business, our, 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 our show should be story driven and, and talent driven, not business driven. You know what I mean? I do. I know what you mean. Uh, at in your house, revenge of the taker. Sean is all over the show fighting off the new heart foundation, Brett, Owen, Davey, and now Brian Pillman added to the mix. Now, of course, Brett's knee is going to be a real situation. So with Brett on the shelf, it looks like we're going to pivot to Austin and Michaels forming an unlikely tag team to take on Owen and Davey over the summer while Brett is trying to heal up. And there's talk that if Brett is healthy enough to wrestle at King of the Ring, it'll be Brett versus Sean. Did you think not too long after WrestleMania, we'll call it April. Did you think you were really going to get Brett and Sean at King of the Ring or were you suspect of that all along? Hmm. I don't know if I want to say I was suspect of it. I just didn't know if, um, I don't know if it was the right time to do it. Right. You, you, you didn't get mania. So why do it at King of the ring? Hold right. off till SummerSlam. I agree. Hold off to survivor series. Let's, 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 let's make them wait even longer for it. Let's build it even more. Get them both healthy. And keep them away. Around this time, we'll call it May of 97. There's talk in the WCW locker room that gets reported in the observer where they're saying they had heard Sean would never put bread over clean. Now, of course we know where that comes from. It comes from Hall and Nash or maybe Waltman, probably Hall and Nash. But when that makes the observer, had you guys heard that? Or did you think that was okay? So you thought at that point it could just be Meltzer bullshit? Yes. Okay. So May 12th, 1997. Boy, this is a big show. It's a pivotal moment in this Brett and Sean saga. The Hart Foundation, which now includes Jim Neidhart, closed the show on Raw. They're all cutting a promo on Shawn Michaels. It goes super long, though, and Brett misses his time cue, as Brett claims, and the show goes off the air before they have the planned finish. 
which was Brett in the ring in a wheelchair. Cause again, he's, he's got a knee injury, but Sean was supposed to hit the super kick. And of course it doesn't happen on the air. So the show goes off the air with Brett just running down Sean and Sean never gives Brett his comeuppance. And I think you're at ringside when this happens. What do you remember in that moment where, you know, we're live and we're about to go off the air and Brett's just going on and on and on. No, I wasn't at ringside. I was, I was a gorilla and I was livid. Absolutely livid. Because Brett knew his cue. There were people down there giving him the cue. There were people telling him to go. Sean was telling him to go. We didn't shoot him so that we could tell Sean, tell him to go. We're not shooting you. So, yeah, it was bad. And, um, yeah, it was the shits, man. It was the shits. And in that one, I, I feel that I feel that Brett was just like, you know, yeah, I'm just going to, I'm going to wait. And, and here's the thing, man. If Brett Hart and Shawn Michaels, both, the, without question, the two guys that I could absolutely count on every single time to nail their time to the second. Bret Hart was a guy that I knew would hit his cue at the exact perfect time whenever he was put in that position. Bret didn't fuck up like that. He just didn't. Bret was that good. Bret Bret and Sean, to me, were the absolute best at that. So... It was something else. It was something else. Cause I know he's getting the cues. Let's, uh, let's talk about how Sean received this because it's been said oh, over the Sean years. Sean was pissed. God yeah. damn. Sean was pissed. And of course he's pissed because the footage does wind up being shown, but it's shown on shotgun and superstars. It's not shown on raw. It's not shown on the big show. I'm sure Sean's furious. Take us backstage after you guys are off the air fans are filing out of the crowd or maybe you're running a dark match but brett sean vince yourself there has to be some interaction on the other side of that curtain what's it look like no sean just came back and and was pissed and you know saying you know he had the cue he never he didn't he never got up he never got up you know he goes "I, I, i fucking he goes i about kicked him out of out of the chair and he goes, I'm trying to be a professional. Now it's Sean. <laughs> I'm trying to be a professional here. Um, and uh, it just, yeah, it was, it was mayhem. And, and Brett came back and I, I, went, I didn't get the cue. And there was, you know, everybody went their separate ways. And, and it was really no more than that. But, you know, yeah, man, I was pissed. I was livid. I was like, you know. I, I'm one also too, man, when you, you don't hit your cues and you don't, uh, things screw up. We're the only one that knows right. we screwed up. Right. The audience doesn't know it. The, the television audience doesn't know that was a screw up. Um, you know, we put in intentional screw ups, and, you know, and get people go, Oh, that was a screw up. Um, just to have fun. But so you can always use that logic too, that, that, Okay, we we planned it that way. We planned to go off the air that way, and then after, and here's what happened after we went off the air, you know, um, and I'll sit there and tell you, yeah, that's how we planned it. It's not, but yeah, it's the shits. That's all I can say, man. Is it just wasn't good. Boy, it gets worse before it gets better. The next week they're in Mobile, Alabama, May 19th. Another memorable moment. You've talked in the past about this. We're going to hit it again here. Brett and Sean are uh, maybe getting a little too far into their shoot comments. And there's one comment here that goes way too far. Sean Michaels does an in-ring promo and he talks about Brett having some sunny days. Boy, that's, uh, that's probably crossing a line. When 
there's lots of rumor and innuendo inside the wrestling business about this young lady who's very attractive and Brett has a wife and small kids at home. Less than ideal. Did you have any idea that comment was coming and what is your reaction and Vince's reaction when that falls out of his mouth? Nobody had any idea that was coming. And I think it was a spur of the moment thing. Um, Brett didn't even catch it live. Okay. Brett didn't even, had no idea what he said. I think Brett knew until the next day when he got home and uh, his wife said something to him. Yeah. So um, totally out of line. Totally out of line. Uh, I thought that was you know immature. It was wrong. And um, does anybody do anything to Sean? Like, does Vince sit him down and say, "All right, we got to find you, man. Something's got to." Well, happen. I don't think Vince heard it or understood it. I got you. It was so inside that it yeah. blew over some heads. Right. I got you. You know, to to the few people that you know may have uh, whispered that that shit. You know, it had to be explained to us afterwards. So anything that has to be explained, it's like, oh. So that that was even inside, inside, inside baseball. Inside the inside baseball. Right. On Thursday. Inside Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> baseball Thursday. It's announced here that the King of the Ring match with Brett and Sean is going to have some weird stipulations. The Hart Foundation is going to be handcuffed around the ring post to each other. And if Brett doesn't beat Sean in under 10 minutes, Brett will never wrestle in the United States again. So we're promising a big match. We're promising some crazy stipulations. We end the show where Austin beats Neidhart in under two minutes. And it's announced that Sean Michaels is going to be in action next week when he's going to be tagging along with Steve Austin to take on Owen and Davey boy for the TV titles. That's an interesting pairing. And he comes back in the ring May 25th. Says, I couldn't wait to get back in the ring. I flew all over the place and put on one of my best performances. Early on in the match, I did my backflip off the top, and I did it for a very specific reason. I knew that everyone, including Brett, was saying I faked my knee injury to get out of putting him over at WrestleMania. I wanted to rub it in their face. Every time I heard rumors about me, I made sure I did something to stick it to the guys who were spreading them. Let's go a few weeks later. January 24th, the Royal Rumble. It's a rematch here for the rock and mankind for the, uh, world title. It's an, I quit match. And this winds up being one of the more brutal matches of all time. We've talked about this in long form. Uh, check it out in our archives. If you'd like, uh, it's 21 minutes, 46 seconds. The gist is they play a tape from a mankind promo earlier in the night when Foley has the mic in front of him, his lifeless body. So it seems that the rocket shoved it down there. And they play the tape over the PA. I quit and I quit. So it's a screw job finish, but that's not really the story. The story is, and it's hard to watch now, brutal chair shots to the head over and over and over again. And Meltzer would crucify it as a lot of people do. If you go back and watch it, we don't know. We didn't know what we know now about head trauma. We should say that. And thankfully, I don't think we'll ever see anything like this ever again. What were you thinking watching that match live? I know we've talked about it before, but it's worth briefly touching on here. Yeah, a lot of cringing. Uh, it, it was, it was violent. It was brutal, and very. Di- you know, look, it's not just difficult to watch now. It was difficult to watch back then. It was something that you were like. Okay, I've seen it. Enough is enough, and move on. But it was ugly, is the best way to describe it. And Barry Blaustein went on to to make that a focal point of beyond the mat. Um, yeah, it's just it's hard to watch. It really is, and and even being quote hardcore in the business type stuff. Nothing, nothing will prepare you for that. It, it, it just was a testament to the toughness of Mick Foley. And that's not always good. Let's also mention there is a little bit of uh hurt feelings 
on the other end of this, Mick Foley would write about it in his book where he didn't feel like the rock took care of him. And maybe the rock took some liberties and I'm sure they've fixed it over the years, but do you remember hearing anything about there being some hurt feelings at the time? At the time, no. And I think that there was a, there was an overall feeling from probably everyone involved in the match and, and those around the business it may have been a little too much that you look at it at the time. And this was something that both guys really wanted to do. Sounds great on paper before you actually do it. But when you're in the middle of it, it's, it's, it's hard to get that eraser out and, and change what you have written in your mind. So you, you go through with it. Um, and, and in fairness, he probably, uh, you know, listen, I've never talked to the rock about this, but I assume he probably got a little bit caught up in the moment and you're running on adrenaline and crowd reaction and you know, you sort of get lost in it and it's not like you can properly communicate with this person who is, is quote unquote selling. So, I mean, I could see how it would happen, but I also feel like if, if, if somebody was really hurt or there were hurt feelings, that there's probably going to be a conversation after. Well, I would hope so. And in the moment, in the heat of the action, it is, it is oftentimes hard to hard to say i i remember mick foley coming back after the hell in a cell match with undertaker in pittsburgh and having thumbtacks all over him and saying to me hey i apologize for not getting the thumbtack spot right it's like uh mick you did get the thumbtack spot and they're stuck all over you so in the heat of the moment you don't always know you ask a guy, are you okay? Right. They say, yeah, I'm fine. Let's go. Right. Um, in the heat of the moment, he may have just been saying, yeah, I'm okay. Let's go. Maybe he didn't say anything because he didn't say anything. Then he's good. Um, when someone's hurt, they'll say, no, I'm hurt. Yeah. And some guys don't want to do that. Well, not only that too, but you got to remember, Nick may not have, I mean, listen, he clearly got a concussion during this. So he's probably not where he can properly communicate and rock, not knowing what we know about head trauma. I guess the reason I keep giving a caveat there is I'm trying to say, I don't think the rock intentionally meant to do permanent harm to anyone. (laughs) You know, I know that sounds silly, but the rock has been crucified for this over the years. And it was a different time where we didn't know what we know now, and it'll never happen again, but It's just hard for me to imagine that anyone would maliciously and purposefully with, with bad intent, do anything to Mick Foley. If that makes sense. I I know for a fact, I mean, I, no one can sit there, but I, I know, I know rock, I know Mick and I don't even think that they could convince me, uh, that rock could convince me. Yeah. I wanted to take his head off. I, I wouldn't believe it. Right. You know, I just I know that there was a lot of respect and admiration between the two and both are professionals. So you couldn't convince me that um, that Rock was like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to take liberties and swing at the guy without having. They did discuss it ahead of time and had an idea of how brutal it would be. Sometimes it's sometimes it's just worse in real life, folks, and people get carried away trying to trying to paint a picture right that they have in their head that sometimes they can't they can't see you can't see the forest for the trees and there is also the old um it's not who goes over it's who got over deal and if you're trying to build that hey the rock is mankind i mean not the rock but mankind is rocky and he has no you know he's not there's no quit in him you, you can't he's <coughs> never going to do that so Supposedly they had agreed on five chair shots. It becomes 11 and there's hurt feelings. The other thing that's of note here that we have touched on, and I want to move on from this, but beyond the mat, Barry Blaustein is there filming Mick's wife, Colette and, and the kids all ringside watching their husband and dad get obliterated by the chair. And man, that's kind of hard to watch in the movie in hindsight. Do you think Vince regrets allowing Blaustein to film the family here? Cause it doesn't exactly paint the best picture of the company. 
Yeah, and and we've done, you know, a whole podcast on that movie in and yeah. of itself. And and I will still stand by it wasn't represented. It was going to be a documentary and something that was going to be in film houses and art houses, not distributed commercially. So, yes, the answer to that question is yes, because I think that people will often gravitate to the negative and the sensationalistic um, of anything. Just that's easy. You know, people want to see that. People want to see what they're not supposed to see. People want to, they, are intrigued with negativity, which is sometimes hard to comprehend, but I get it. And so, yeah, I think that they portrayed this in a way, in a way, but I don't know it was an accurate way. The next night on raw big boss man is going to beat the rock. That's right. The big boss man beats the rock in a hardcore match to determine the number one contendership. Rock's going to grab a camera and take a photo during the match. Lots of brawling through the crowd. He's even going to whip the boss man with Earl Hebner's belt. He uses the rock bottom on the stage. Prince Albert runs in, um, rock hits Albert with a chair. It gives boss man, the people's elbow. Albert makes the save boss man gets the pin in four minutes and 41 seconds with that boss man slam. And the rock goes nuts, destroying boss man with a chain and Albert with a TV monitor. Everybody's bleeding. Rock also destroys Sergeant Slaughter, another referee, and even your brother, Dr. Tom. So we're seeing a badass version here of the rock. Is this to show the, the dark side, the mean side, the angry side, what are we trying to accomplish with the rock here in this segment? Well, I like to call that going Samoan. Okay. And rock did it. Rock did it pretty damn good. And this was an opportunity to just show an unhinged rock and holy shit, you piss this guy off. Well, what's going to happen? So yeah, that was, that was a going Samoan rock and be able to go out and beat everybody's ass. You then had completely forgotten that he just got pinned for one, two, three. Let's talk about sex boys and girls. Remember the days when you were always ready to go? Well, now you can be again, thanks to Blue Chew. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chillable form and at a fraction of the cost. Take these dudes anytime, day or night. So you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Roll Tide. And then the process is simple, y'all. You sign up at BlueChew.com. You consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you receive your prescription within days. And here's the best part. It's all done online. That means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversation, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Bluetooth tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. Bluetooth wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. And boy, do we have a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code WRESTLE at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is WRESTLE and you'll receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring today's podcast. And Bruce's Ding Dong. Let's talk about the video package. Speaking of Hunter, building up Sean and Hunter here. They show some clips from 1997 with DX. Uh, and then they show Sean coming back in 02 with the DX shirts and the skit. And ultimately, that sets up the pedigree uh, where Triple H gets to turn on his best friend, Sean Michaels. And there's a great line from Hunter in this package here. I use Sean to get to the top just like he used me to stay at the top. I thought this was one of the, the more well-done packages that were on the pay-per-view. Uh, what do you think of the package and the angle to bring Sean in? And then we'll talk about the behind the scenes. I uh, thought the package was excellent, and I thought the angle was excellent because it was logical, and everybody can understand jealousy, and everybody can understand a friendship and a bond getting broken up like that. The video of someone jumping Sean from behind and then putting his head through a window, the bloody aftermath, and then the reveal from Sean enhancing the video and then challenging Hunter to a match at SummerSlam, this feels like you know, exactly what Vince was talking about in beyond the mat. We make movies. Uh, what did you think of the whole, uh, jumping Shawn Michaels head through the rental car, enhancing the video, the big, great reveal. I thought it was some of the better storytelling, even if it was a little predictable. 
Well, here, here's what you have. You have a guy that we didn't know what we really had in him in Shawn Michaels. He, this is going to be his one off. The only match we're going to do. We couldn't do a, a whole lot physically with him prior to that. So you don't want, you, you can't have him work a match on TV. Um, you got to get creative in how you get him involved. And we didn't want to, the audience to see them have that physicality. So yeah, you just, you, you got to get creative and get out there with your storytelling. And I thought that it was beautifully done. Um, and again, especially for us, because we, we had no idea what the hell we had. Um, let's kind of talk about the backstage here because, I think everybody knows we're going to cover this at some point long form. DX has been on the pole 9,000 times, and they lose every time. But I'm hopeful that they'll win eventually. Uh, But the story with Shawn Michaels and Triple H and DX is a fun one. It's been well documented. We'll get there eventually. Uh, But Shawn ultimately becomes injured at the Royal Rumble 1998 in a casket match against The Undertaker. He goes over the top. Uh, Wax is back on the edge of the casket, and supposedly this causes all kinds of back problems. That leads to a rather interesting first quarter in the WWE as we build towards WrestleMania 14. Sean is not in a good place mentally, physically, or emotionally. Storms out of the press conference, and he's gone. And now this is going to be his first match back in the WWE. Uh, He has some trials and tribulations personally while he's out. Uh, He finds God. He turns his life over. Uh, He also had struggled with addiction. There's rumor and innuendo that he showed up under the influence to a WWE show once and kind of showed his ass. And Triple H even tried to put him in his place. And actually, according to the rumor and innuendo, take your pills, Bruce, tries to have Sean removed. What can you tell us about the time in between? Because I think most people know that Sean said he was done with wrestling, never coming back, does things that are uncharacteristic of Sean. He does an RF video shoot interview. He opens a wrestling school. Thank goodness he did. We got, you know, Brian Danielson out of it. Um, and, and, and in an effort to build his own promotion, actually works a match that I think people have forgot that went down in April of 2000 for the Texas Wrestling Alliance uh, against Paul Diamond. What was going on in the downtime? Did he really get kicked out of an event? What was the relationship like with Sean and Vince during this four-year gap? What was it like with Paul and Sean, to the best of your understanding? From my vantage point, there was not a whole lot. I don't remember Sean getting kicked out. That That's totally news to me. Um, maybe, maybe it happened. I, I have no idea. I wasn't there. don't remember that. I do remember from time to time when we would be in – San Antonio or maybe Austin that Sean would come by and say hello. That's where Undertaker and I uh, nicknamed him the little Dutch boy when he cut all his hair off and he had kind of a bowl cut. And we didn't even know who the hell it was when we saw him. Uh, He had stopped training. He got way out of shape. I had gone down because Sean had started his wrestling school. So the only really the only interaction that I had with Sean during that time was, Hey, do you have any talent? Right. Um, Got anybody that we might want to take a look at. I'd really love to come down and spend a weekend with you and see what you've got. So at first it was, I was met with, no, none of my guys ready yet to then eventually he warmed up to the idea. And I, I went to San Antonio, Sean picked me up and, went over to the house and then uh, we went to a show. And then the next day we went out and saw his training class with Rudy Gonzalez there. Uh, There was Spanky, Brian Kendrick. Um, There was uh, obviously Daniel Bryan. There was Lance Cade. And um, I want to say there were four total. I can't remember the fourth one. But he had some really good talent there. And we talked back and forth, and and Sean would get in the ring with these guys. He wouldn't take bumps, but he would show them little things. And, and I remember after watching him in the ring training these guys, we, we went to a town that night where he had a little spot show. And I said, man, 
you know you've got another one in you. He said, nope, I've wrestled my last match. I'm done. And I said, you know, they all say that, but I'll use the old bruiser and crusher analogy. All you've got to do is go out there and give them the entrance and kick and punch and throw a super kick, and they're going to be happy. His mindset was that if Shawn Michaels is going to appear, he has to be Shawn Michaels. Right. He's got to be the showstopper. He's got to be the main event. He has got to be the guy they remember, not a fragment of that guy. So he had no desire. He's like, I'm, I'm done. I'm not training anymore. And I remember he was eating a huge chocolate chip cookie. And he says, I'm eating chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> And he says, I, I, I'm done. I'm done. Not, I'm not, I'm not going back in the ring. And then eventually, I don't know, six months after that is when he had the street fight that he had in uh, San Antonio for his own promotion. And he was cleaning up his act. You know, we'd heard that he, he was doing a lot better. He came down and saw us uh, in San Antonio and looked great. Uh, completely different than when I had been down and seen him in San Antonio before that. Um, floated the idea out there. You got one more? Just one. And that's how we got here. Just floated it out there. And he said, yeah, he trusted, he trusted Hunter and felt that he and Hunter could have a match. But they wanted to do a street fight so that he would be forgiven and not have to go out and have that Shawn Michaels wrestling match. So was the idea always to just do the one story here with Triple H and that be it? Yep, 100%. One match, one time, this is it. He's not coming back. Not going to get another one. This is it. Um. Any sort of heat that you recall at all between Sean or Hunter here? At this point, no. No, at this point, they were excellent. Long lost buds. Happy to be back together. Hebner is the referee here, uh, and he has a big part in the match where he uh, admonishes Triple H for his behavior. It's not something that we see very often in a match, and it was weird kind of seeing him here because Hebner was such a staple in the WWE, and and now, not so much. You were there when Hebner was, you know, exiled. Briefly tell us what happened there. We've never talked about it on the show before. Uh, we were in, gosh, somewhere in West Virginia or something like that. I, um, I can picture the building. I don't remember the particular name, but there was some kind of story that allegedly Dave and Earl had been selling uh, bootleg WWE merchandise, and they were released. It's one of those stories that has never been told uh, from really either side. And people put, you know, it's, it's all rumor and innuendo. What what I just told you, we weren't we weren't told. We were got that surmised from uh, Earl later on that that's what that, that's what they were accused of doing. There's rumor and innuendo out there that. The guy, the Hebners, were actually doing a bit of an embroidery type business, a screen printing business, and they were making WWE logo and branded swag, but actually giving it to the boys, including the McMahons themselves. That is true. So the the allegation is they weren't just doing it to hook up the cast and crew; they were doing it to profiteer as well, and that's what Vince had a problem with. Well, and, and apparently, uh, and again, this is all rumor and um, innuendo. Rumor and innuendo was that whoever had the shop in St. Louis or Kansas City, wherever the hell they were, um, was selling stuff out of his shop. And that, that, that they had or, made unlicensed without letting correct. the WWE participate. Right. Right. And that's where the rub came. And because Dave and Earl were associated with them, that that was the last straw, and they were gone. The it last was quick. I mean, I mean, it was it was they came in and left and were escorted out by security. Did you think that was a fair way to handle them, given their time with the company? 
I don't know all the particulars, but it was shocking to everybody. Uh, that was definitely something that had everybody buzzing. What the hell happened there? But it's also the, the culture, uh, it's the culture of the company that things happen and, and you go on with your life and, and business continues. You still have your job to do and you just move forward. Put your head down and go. I mean, that's kind of what happened with you, right? Right. Do you think that um, if there is a flaw, because you don't, you don't often kind of fault Vince with much here, do you think that that is a character flaw of his that he can just so quickly move on and, and throw – so many years, you know, because this is the Hebners have been here forever. And now because of maybe a misunderstanding, I mean, I don't know. I wasn't there. Maybe a misunderstanding. Their lives are forever changed. Do you think that that's maybe a character, character flaw Vince's? I think it's, it's a flaw, but it's also a defense mechanism for him too, because that way he, he doesn't have to, you know, deal with it and he can just move on and, um, you're dead to me. So he, he just, he just goes on and, and next. So I, I guess it's, it's a blessing and a curse all at the same time. Um, when you're there, you know, nothing else. It's, it's just, man, it's, it's, it's just the culture. It's just the way that it is. Right. And you accept it and you accept it blindly and, and you move forward. Um, so, you know, everybody talks about Paul Heyman and the Kool-Aid. The same can be said for, you know, the WWE. Because once you are in that bubble, that is all that exists. Life on the outside doesn't matter and doesn't exist. Let's talk about the card again, because I feel like this is maybe the strongest year as far as the card that we've ever had for returns. You've got in 2002. Triple H, Hulk Hogan, Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, Eddie Guerrero, Chris Benoit, and Shawn Michaels all coming back uh, in 2002. Definitely, you know, the biggest comeback year in history. And, and to this point on the roster, 15 of the 18 wrestlers would be uh, world champions, either past, present, or future. And Shawn Michaels is still in one of the more featured matches here after you know, more than four years on the sidelines and triple H had come back just that prior January. So he's only been back for about eight months. What was the expectation going into the match? Because it feels like this blows away every expectation possible. The expectations were low. I mean, I think so. that's fair. You know, you've got two guys who haven't worked each other in a long time, no matter how good of friends they are. And yeah, Sean was one of the greatest of all time, but after a four and a half year hiatus, you don't expect him to come back and somehow be fucking better than before. Well, also, but also they had never worked together against each other. Not like so, this for sure. Yeah. And, and so you, you've got a lot of just unknowns. We weren't, you know, <laughs> and this sounds, this sounds funny, but we weren't sure what the hell Sean's body looked like. We weren't sure if the, the when the the damn uh, shirt came off and the gear came off, you know what what he's going to look like. So we definitely didn't know after he got in the ring and and being in front of that crowd. You can go out and do all the cardio you want, do the stair step stepper for hours at a time. That is different than being in the ring and working a match. Completely different cardio, completely different, uh, just blowing up factor. So we didn't know if Sean was going to go out there and blow up in 10 minutes. Sure. We didn't know if he was going to get out there and his back was going to seize up. Um, if he was just going to be off half a step, had no clue at all. The angle leading up to this, uh, who was in charge of the majority of writing for that? And who was the, who was the agent for the match? Do you remember? I want to say it was probably Michael Hayes for the match at this time. Uh, Brian would have written the majority of the, of the storyline. Uh, Sean has went on record as saying he didn't feel like he got closure from how his career had ended after WrestleMania 14, where he lost to Steve Austin. And so he goes to triple H and says he wants to wrestle one more match. And, and he specifically says he wants to do this because he wants his son to see him wrestle. 
and he asked Triple H to have the match with him. Is that the way you remember that going down, that it was important to Sean for his son to see him wrestle, much like we heard Goldberg say earlier this year? Yes, definitely was. Uh, he, his son had heard about him and had seen you know, tapes and different things, but he had never seen, seen his dad wrestle. Do you think, um, and I'm sure we'll cover this long form at some point, but do you think Sean's back was as injured as we were told it was at the Royal Rumble in 98, or was Sean just burnt out and had so much other stuff going on that he just needed to get out of the race car for a little while? Well, I do believe that his uh, back was injured badly, but I sure. also think that um, everything else combined made exacerbated that. Right. Exacerbated the attitude, it exacerbated the injury, and it was the right time to go away. So it makes all the sense in the world that Sean wants to come back here, but it also makes sense, and Triple H has said, that going into this match, Sean was scared, Sean's wife was scared, and even Sean's mom was scared. And Triple H says that he told Sean's mom something like, I won't let anything happen to your boy. Um, that feels like a big emotional dump that you're going to have in this match. And you guys all kind of felt that you had low expectations. Do you remember that being the thought amongst the writing team, amongst Vince, amongst the boys, or was it just more of a curiosity and just the natural assumption, man, four and a half years off. I mean, it's not going to be the Sean of 96. No one expected the Sean of 96. Right. And I, I, as I had said to Sean, when I was in San Antonio, People aren't expecting that. They're just going to be happy to see him come back, uh, throw some punches, and by God, hit the super kick and sell. That's all he had to do. Um, and as I expressed earlier, you know, Sean wanted to be Sean Michaels of old. He had to be the showstopper in the main event. Nobody, and I mean nobody, expected what we got. Probably one of the best comeback matches of all. Let's hit some of the high points here. The sidewalk slam onto the folding chair. The backbreaker under the whole holding chair. Holy shit. What a spot that was knowing the history of his back and the story that had been told and how great was triple H being bloodied. And then Sean nipping up to a big pop. The crowd was so with it. They were on that emotional roller coaster. That's when you knew to me, this is a great match and they're pulling out all the stops here. The elbow through the table to the floor seems a little uh, uncharacteristic for a comeback match, but certainly, you know, they're wanting to pull out all the stops they do the elbow off the ladder where beforehand Sean points to the crowd and says, I love each and every one of you. And then Sean selling from that elbow and then tuning up the band was just awesome. So one of the better closing sequences and maybe the best comeback match ever. And Sean is teasing the super kick, but all of a sudden triple H catches the kick rather than just taking the super kick and giving the fans their happy ending. They do a pedigree counter uh, and all of a sudden, Sean steals a pin. And Sean's victorious, but Triple H attacks him after the match with a sledgehammer. Uh, what would you think of the match? This is maybe one of the best matches of 2002. If you haven't seen it, you should go out of your way to see it. Meltzer gave it four and three-quarter stars, saying that, you know, this is a match that lines him up for the WWE Hall of Fame uh, or the, the Observer Hall of Fame. What would you think? Ooh. I thought that the match top to bottom emotionally, physically, everything about it delivered on all levels. These guys went out, they're friends, and you're always going to work best with somebody that you like. Um, they proved it. They tore the frigging house down. And it was the right finish. It was the happy finish. But, again, it was a one-off. We knew we had Hunter. We knew that what we were doing with Hunter going forward so we had to get some heat back and, and make him whole at the end. Um, it wasn't about a 50-50 thing. It was, okay, let's make him happy. But now, you know, I got, got to worry about the guy that's going to be here tomorrow. And we thought, okay, hey, great. We saw, you know, Sean's last match. He, he went out went out in style. I don't think, well, no, I'm not going to say that because I know better. Um, for me, I did not think that was Sean's last match. I don't. I, I look at. I look at everybody. I do. I do think we have seen Sean's last match, 
but I, I'm skeptical. I always look at all these guys from Undertaker to Angle to everybody. It's like, mm, they got another one left in them. Well, um, let's talk about what's really become a forgotten match in a pretty legendary feud. It's the Undertaker and Mankind. And here we're going to have Paul Bearer in a cage hung above the ring, which is like old school. I guess the first time I remember seeing this is with JJ Dillon. Uh, but I think it was commonly referred to as a shark cage. Uh, when do you first remember seeing managers in cages above rings? Gary Hart in Houston, Texas with the, when it was a rat cage, actually. So we referred to it as, but it was, <laughs> I remember, man, explain it the rat all... cage. Help me understand the terminology here. Well, it's just, it was a cage. It was just, was a cage because Gary Hart was in it. We called it a rat cage, Okay. but it wasn't big enough that, that he could stand in it. So you'd put him in it and he would sit in it with his feet dangling through the bars. Gary Hart, by the way, very tall human being. Yes. Yes. And I just always remember, man, we would hoist it up and there was a, a pulley way up through the the drop ceiling at the top of the Coliseum. So you don't even know what the hell this thing's rigged on. But if you look up at the, at the ceiling, you see like, you know, the, what, what are they called in the drop ceiling? What are those little squares called? Ceiling tiles. Okay. The ceiling tiles are, they're, they're missing all over the top of the building and shit. And this rope just disappears into the abyss up there wrapped around something and then the pulley is there and you get about five guys, five or six big guys and they pull Gary Hart up and hoist him up. And then when he gets up to the, to the right position, just tie him off on the, uh, top ring post. And that's the science of it, but it was to, to keep managers out and it was effective. But, you know, once you've seen, the finish that has been overused 9 million times of the manager dropping the gimmick down to, to whoever his guy is and the baby face getting it and using it. And so the sh cage was effective. Um, you know, you, you've kind of seen it. Yeah. Um, the, the best use of, um, the cage is we, we did it with Jerry Lawler and, Lawler was up in the cage and Lawler had picked, picked his nose to get it to bleed and got a scab. Mm. And then when Lawler got up and goes, no, 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 I'm afraid of heights. I'm afraid of heights. Lawler picked the scab and his nose started to bleed because when certain people, when they get high and they get in the, you know, certain height, their nose will bleed. And it was just ingenious that, that Lawler did that. And then there was a time that we, we put Jeff Jarrett in a cage and we pulled Jeff Jarrett up to the top of the roof and just <laughs> left him up there for a couple of matches. <laughs> and you, you could hear on the, and we kept recording and Jeff was screaming so loud that we had to finally take him down because his audio was screwing up the matches we were trying to tape. Bruce Pritchard, I know you're involved. Get Bruce out. And he just, yeah. So we let him down. The good old days. The good old days. So listen, this feud with The Undertaker, man. I mean, The Undertaker and Mankind have done it all, right? So they had a boiler room brawl match at SummerSlam. They had a buried alive match. I mean, once we've, we've beat each other all over and under the building, and then we literally buried a guy. Now we're just going to have a regular wrestling match, but it's almost like the rebirth of the undertaker. So he's got a totally new look. He comes down, like he drops down from the ceiling and he's got like bat wings and a new haircut and the teardrop tattoos. I guess he killed a guy or two. Um, the match is, is good. Uh, Meltzer would even say it made great psychological sense, but he did say it was nowhere near the level that the previous matches had been. But he sums it up like this after doing boiler room matches and buried alive matches where the undertaker was all but killed. It's hard to put two guys in a regular match and get the people jazzed about it. I mean, that's probably a fair criticism, right? We're, we're probably working backwards. Maybe we should have started with this and worked our way up to a buried alive. And, I mean, but I guess he's reborn. I don't know. Talk me through this. 
He descended. Yes. From the heavens above. He did. Yeah, th- this was what I refer to as a uh, pirate taker. Yes. He hated that, I bet. Oh, he hated Oh, my God, he hated it. Yeah, between Wendy and pirate taker. And, and, and I... I <laughs> yeah, pirate taker. Uh, he's like, what do you think? I'm like, um... Arr! And he would get so mad. Um, but, yeah... Again, it, you know, it, it was. Who does he? He's got to come back and get, get revenge, and you you got to, you know, short of doing a decapitation match, it's you, you kind of almost have to start from the beginning all over again. With Taker at this point, so, um, I thought it worked. I thought about. I, I don't think that Taker and Mick could have a bad match. Yeah, no, these guys. I mean, even when it's not great, it's good. Uh, and as you would imagine, mankind comes back using a foreign object, but Undertaker's going to hit the tombstone. That's it. Bear gets lowered into the ring. Of course, per the pre-match stipulation of Undertaker wins, he gets five minutes alone with the man who betrayed him this past summer. And before Undertaker can do anything to him, the executioner nails him from behind. So Taker comes back and runs executioner off. Meltzer didn't really love that. Called it a weak sequence. We know it's going to set up the undertaker and the executioner in December. And unfortunately, Terry Gar- Terry Gordy is, uh, well, his days are numbered here in the WWF, but let's talk about the look, because that's really what people remember most about this exchange and match. It's just the pirate taker, as you called him. Is this just creative services and, and, and Mr. Calloway being a good sport and saying, okay, I'll try it. Or do you remember him having some influence on the idea? And then an execution, he was just like, I was wrong. This sucked. Uh, Undertaker had a lot of influence in it and worked with people and to try and come up with the different look. So he, he had, he had a lot of, he had a lot of input on it. Where he's loading the, the car on a flatbed. Well, Monday night raw gets out. So people in the building who have been in the building watching the show are now coming out and they're getting ready to go and get their taxis and catch their trains and go home and they see the car and they start throwing shit at the car and they are pelting it with pennies and bottles and trash. So even if the damage had been confined to just the hood, now the entire car is just absolutely getting trashed. People are throwing shit, trying to knock out the back uh, brake lights and things like that. It was insane. It, It was absolutely insane. So by the time Billy got it back and Howard got it over to his car guy where he had bought the car three weeks before, yeah, he's like, man, basically we need to redo everything. We you you need a whole new body, you need a new windshield, you need new uh tail lights, you need new new this, new that. Finally, and, and Howard would would drive it and go, Well, oh, just you know, it, it just doesn't drive the same anymore. He had it for three weeks. Oh, it just doesn't drive the same anymore. I I don't know what's wrong with it. I think maybe maybe when Sean took that backdrop, it it hit something that uh has impaired its driving ability. So it's like, you know what? Ribs on me, just buy a new car. Howard's wife at the time put her foot down and called Vince and do not buy him a new car. The car's fine. <laughs> So I think Vince just had the damn thing repair and gave Howard a hefty bonus and hearty thank you. And Howard was fine. On May 17th, we see another pretty big shock. Marty Jannetty's back and he interrupts Michael and challenges him for the intercontinental title later in the show. And during their match, Mr. Perfect comes to ringside and throws his towel in Sean's face. Marty inside cradles him and wins the intercontinental title. Uh, this, I believe is Marty's fourth shot in the WWF. And of course we know what's coming. 
what, what? Dude, Marty Jannetty, man, maybe one of the most interesting stories in the history of wrestling. If you haven't already, check out that Rockers episode. But he was fired the second. This had to be it. Though, well, right? no. I mean, he's been fired multiple times, and we, we run through the whole deal. But when you guys bring him back here, you're bringing him back and putting the belt on him. Is this not in the book of bad ideas to put the belt on a guy who's already proven himself to be untrustworthy? There's a long history of championships on guys that had long histories of being not trustworthy. Oh my so, gosh. Uh, we just called that Tuesday. Oh, it's like that. Well, you know, sometimes you, 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 you play the hand with the cards that you're dealt. Okay. Well, I'm not mad at it. Okay. Time out. You know, it's fun to think about all of this stuff way after the fact, but context is King. And I don't know that we, as a wrestling community have always been super fair talking about Marty Jannetty. Because whenever we're talking about a tag team and it feels like one guy's the breakout star and one guy maybe isn't, people would say, oh, he's the Marty about the guy who wasn't the big star. But in fact, if you go back and you talk to a lot of sort of wrestling gurus, they'll tell you at the time they thought Marty Jannetty was going to be the bigger star. So was it Marty's in ring? Was it Marty's performance or was it Marty's outside of the ring stuff? that kept him from being the star that Shawn Michaels was because I can't reconcile how the guy got chance after chance after chance. If he wasn't a damn good performer who had great matches and someone that Vince thought could be a huge star. I mean, at the time of their breakup, it seemed that Shawn wasn't really that much better than Marty in many respects, but Shawn was maybe more dependable. If you could even believe that was a thing, but there had to be a reason, right? So here's the thing. We like to do this every now and again on our podcast. What if, right? What if the roles were reversed? What if Sean had some of his problematic behavior early in his WWE run and they went with Marty instead? What if it was the reverse? What if Marty is the one doing the super kicking and Sean Michaels is the one flying through the glass? Marty's issues perhaps would have remained the same. But would Sean have been lost in the shuffle or would the cream have risen to the top? That's another thing that worth debating to me. Like what if that breakup goes differently? Does Sean still get where he winds up or does the company, you know, timing is everything, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And I think bringing Marty back to win the intercontinental title has to be a vote of confidence from Vince McMahon. But again, does some of this come back to what well, he was easier to do business with? And can you imagine, I mean, <laughs> Knowing how problematic the stories are going to be with Shawn Michaels in just a few years after that, can you imagine that Shawn Michaels was somehow easier to do business with than Marty Jannetty? Or at least that's perhaps what the thinking was at the time. Either way, we've got to talk about Marty's, uh, well, much talked about firing as a sign that Vince McMahon really liked him and, uh, had faith, trust, and confidence in him. And I, I don't know, man, it's just fun to sort of, what if an armchair quarterback, how this all could have been different had, uh, the roles been reversed. And I know what you're saying. Oh, that could never happen. Do you really not think Marty Jannetty could have had a hell of a ladder match with razor at WrestleMania 10? Of course he could. Could Marty have had a great match with Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 12? Of course he could, you know, could. Could Marty have carried Kevin Nash to a great match at a pay-per-view? Of course he could. Marty Jenny was a worker, man. He could have did. He could have checked all those boxes. It's just fun to think about those what ifs. Hmm. Let's get back to it. Sean says the next yeah. week they're in Nova Scotia and he went to talk to Vince. He said, I knew I was going to win the belt back from Marty. And I was concerned about my matches getting stale. Ever since I'd won the title, I had been doing a lot of DQs and count outs and every match ended the same way. My opponent and I would put on an exciting show, but the endings were just brutal and took the wind out of our sails. He asked me what I wanted to do about it. What about giving me a bodyguard? Vince asked, who do you have in mind? Well, back in March, after I'd separated my shoulder in the match against the nasties, I was sitting at home one Saturday night and decided to turn on the WCW Saturday night show. I was always working on the weekend, so I never actually had a chance to watch that. 
Now that I had the time, I figured out I'd check it out. So I'm watching and I see this guy named Vinny Vegas do an interview. He was really funny and entertaining and I couldn't help but notice he's huge. I think they were billing him at something like seven feet and over 300 pounds, which was pretty accurate. So I saw this guy on WCW TV and I mentioned him. Vince said, I can't do that, Sean. I don't want any WCW guys coming in. There are legal and contract issues. I just don't want to deal with. And so Sean pushes, but he's very funny. And Vince says, it's a contract issue. I don't want to get into it. We'll put this, this idea together and see what happens. And he used to say that a lot. So he comes out of our meeting and I go looking for Rick and Scott Steiner. I knew they'd just been in WCW and they might know about this guy. So I find Rick Steiner and ask him and he says, oh yeah, that's Kevin Nash. He's a good buddy of mine. I ask what his deal is. I saw him on TV, thought he was a riot and Rick puts him over huge. He's a great guy. So Sean pitches, he'd actually like to do the bodyguard gimmick with him to Rick Steiner and wants to know what the contract situation for Kevin is. So Rick says, I've got his number. I'll go call him right now. So he goes down the hall and uses a payphone and calls him. And Kevin says, I'd love to do it. So the very next day, Kevin Nash tries to get out of his contract. And ta-da, before you know it, Kevin Nash is going to be at TV the next week with Shawn Michaels. It's amazing how all this came together. What do you remember about Diesel coming into the company? Well, I, I do remember Sean coming in and having the idea about the bodyguard and all that, you know, we did have to be extremely careful because you couldn't tamper with someone's contract. The very first question that you have to ask them is, is, are you under contract? If they answer yes, next question is, when are you free and when do you have the ability in your contract to negotiate and to talk? Um, then they give you a date, mark it down, and that's when you go back and talk to them. But to talk to, especially someone in my capacity or Vince or JJ or Pat, we were not allowed, man. You just couldn't have that conversation with the talent because that's tampering with their contracts. How you get around that is, you know, talent talks to talent. And if they want to share some of their contractual details, then they sure as hell can, which is what happened in this case and we still were like hey he's under contract we can't we can't talk to him how could you talk to him if he had a window in the contract where he could negotiate or if he was not under contract at all so that's when kevin nash went down and got his got his release and i think he told him he was going to go back to being a bouncer in a strip club and wanted to just be free and clear of the wrestling business. He was done. He'd given it a shot and wanted to move on. Only wasn't doing anything with him. They had nothing for him, so they gave him his release. He immediately faxed it over to J.J. Dillon, and the rest, as I say, is history. The business is just gaining momentum. I mean, it felt like in 98, well, it can't get any bigger than this. But all the indicators as we march toward WrestleMania is going to be even bigger it's pretty unbelievable is it not yeah it was a climb that i think that if you've been around the business and you believe in the cyclical nature of the business this was a climb that man it it was kept getting bigger and bigger because i'll give you an analogy and a comparison is for example in the mid-south where they would build 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 to the superdome but yet nothing was big enough to fill the Superdome of 60,000 plus. It was big enough that would take it to 30,000, which was two and three times larger than any arena in the territory. Yes, and that don't think in any way, shape, or form I'm (laughs) demeaning that because that's fucking insanity back in those days. But here you're at a point where you're going to 20,000 seat arenas, you're going to stadiums, you're you're running all of these huge, huge shows. You're packing them and people are coming back for more and more and more and more. So there was a clamoring for content. There was a clamoring for uh, more product. And the business was just 
on fire. It's really just unbelievable. And, um, we should mention Steve Austin defeating Mr. McMahon in the steel cage match earns him a title shot at WrestleMania. So now the stage is set. Now that the rock has won the world title in this ladder match, he's the world champ and he's going to defend against Steve Austin at WrestleMania 15. Is there any bigger main event than rock Austin for WrestleMania? No, no, it was without a doubt the two most popular and hottest stars in the industry at that time. WrestleMania 15. Here we are one of three, I guess it's part one of a trilogy of rock and Austin here at WrestleMania. This one in 99, of course. Yeah. One, we had all that planned in 97. We were ready to do that a year earlier. Uh, the go home episode of raw on our way to WrestleMania 14, Austin would pin then intercontinental champion rock fast forward a year later. And they're not on the raw. They're in the main event here. Big deal. Steve Austin regains the world title 16 minutes and 42 seconds. Jim Ross is brought out to announce the main event gets a huge ovation. Um, rock. I mean, Austin, it has to have Jr. on the call. Does it not? Yeah, I think so. Big WrestleMania match main event, put your main event announcer out there. Three and a half stars. Meltzer says it was a really good main event, but not at the level of heat of their raw match last year or even their tag match in San Jose, uh, two weeks ago. But at this point with well, the baby face, Steve Austin, you know, he is the icon here. He's the person who's, he's the straw that stirs the drink, so to speak. Rocks a heel. You got to have the baby face win in this era, right? You weren't having heels win in the main event of WrestleMania, not back then. Well, Steve was red hot too at this point and the rivalry for, you know, this, this chapter of that rivalry was now for the WWE championship and before it had been for the intercontinental championship, it was, it was a little different in the chemistry that rock and Austin have had since day one. Yeah. It was a happy moment. It was, it was happy, happy, joy, joy. 15, 17, 19, uh, the trilogy. WrestleMania, Rock Austin. Which of the three did you prefer? I'm probably going to be in the minority here, but I preferred this one. Really? Here's why. Yes. Well, here's why. Um, I didn't like. I love. I love 17. Says WrestleMania 17 to me is the the best WrestleMania of all time. Um, but I didn't like the. Mr. McMahon and Steve turn in WrestleMania, right? The last, the last one was special and it was great. Very sentimental to me, Mm -hmm. but as far as the match and as far as the story and everything going into it, this was the best match. The first one for WrestleMania, the second one had probably a better story. And the third one was more sentimental, but to me, this was the, this one was special because it was the first one. I think they're going to do a rematch the very next month at backlash. And this seems to be one of their forgotten pay-per-view matches. Uh, they also wrestled, uh, at the, uh, degeneration X pay-per-view in December of 97, where Austin would pin rock in a few minutes to retain, but here at backlash is the main events for the world title, 17 minutes and seven seconds. And uh, early in the show, Shane McMahon is going to vow on the name of his beloved grandfather. that if Austin has rock pinned, he would count fairly. And Vince is mad, but Stephanie assured everyone that if Shane used Vince senior's name, he'd be fair. And I guess that sort of guaranteed that he wouldn't, you know, the story though, four and a half stars. Ultimately, uh, rock's going to hit Austin with the belt. Hebner's going to run out. Austin kicks out. Austin then hits the stunner and a belt shot. This time Hebner counts three Austin retains, but afterwards Vince comes to the ring with Austin's belt, the smoking skull, if you will, doesn't hand him the belt, but puts it on the mat for Austin to pick up and celebrate. Then the ministry are backstage where Vince's limo is where Stephanie was. And the cops tell the drug say that, uh, 
or the cops tell the driver to drive away. Stephanie doesn't want to leave until her dad comes back. And as the show ends, we get that famous shot where it's the undertaker behind the wheel. So maybe that's the reason it's forgotten because of the big undertaker finish, but st- uh, four stars, uh, four and a quarter stars rather from Meltzer. He liked it even better than WrestleMania. Why do you think this is like the forgotten pay-per-view match? Is it because of the whole Stephanie undertaker scene? Yeah. And you know, I think that when you're looking at just matches again, this is the argument story will outweigh, you know, just matches every day of the week. Right. So to the mass audience and, and the mass viewer, they were more interested in the story and they remembered the story. You're usually going to remember the last thing you see. So going back to take her driving away in the limousine, that's, that's what they remembered. All right, listen up. We've got great news. We're excited to announce a new affiliate partnership with fanatics and the WWE shop. It's an easy way to support your favorite podcast shop, official WWE gear and apparel by using our special URL shop wrestling merch.com that's shop wrestling merch.com. Or if you're watching along with us on YouTube, just hit that QR code that's up on the screen right now and check out the description below for the link. We'll have it up on all of our socials as well. But you can shop with confidence for your favorite WWE superstar tees, hoodies, caps, championship belts, and more with the WWE shop. And don't forget to use our special link shop wrestling merch.com. Not only do we get some great deals and some great swag, but it's also an easy way to support the show That's shop wrestling merch.com. So we got more promos the following week, you know, we're talking about, and this is one of my favorite Bret Hart promos. Uh, this is on July 28th in Pittsburgh. Brett says, if you wanted to give the United States an enema, you'd stick the hose right here in Pittsburgh. What a great line that is. Right, Bruce. It's a horrible line, Conrad. I was just in Pittsburgh. It's a beautiful city and by God, it's in America. Well, it was a good line. You're right. It was a great line. You got to admit, it was a great line. It was a great line. And one of the best that I think everybody remembers everywhere. That was good shit. He said that the uh, Patriot debuted coming out, standing next to Steve Austin and Shawn Michaels. And he says that would be like Bill Clinton standing next to the Unabomber and Richard Simmons. Uh, Draw your own conclusions there. And and he also goes and, and takes a couple of jabs at Shawn Michaels saying, you know, if he screws him out of the title, he can quote, sit at home for 10 years and find his smile. One of the better promos. This is probably the best promo year of Brett's career. Don't you agree? This, this entire just time in Bret Hart's career to me was some of the best shit because you got to, you got the sourpuss Brett and you get, you got to see a different side of Brett that people had never seen before. And it came across as genuine and true. And it was the best work I think Brett has ever done in his career. This is the raw where we see Hunter Hearst Helmsley wrestling Vader, or he's supposed to, but mankind comes out dressed up as a cameraman and attacks Helmsley until China takes him down and starts pounding him. They start brawling through the crowds, Hunter and mankind. Whose idea was dressing up mankind like a cameraman? That's kind of fun. We hadn't seen that, that a lot at that time. It was Mick's idea. And I remember saying to Mick, Mick, I don't know how the hell we're going to disguise you as, as a cameraman and get you to ringside to where people aren't going to know it's you. I mean, look at you. And I swear to God, Mick turns and there was a cable puller that was down around the ring and he was helping set up that night. He goes, well, look at that guy. <laughs> and I went, case closed. All right, we can put you in a cap. We can get you in, a, in an outfit, get you down the ring. It'll be fine. Um, yeah, that was Mick Foley's idea. We also see an arm wrestling match here with Shamrock and Bulldog. Of course, there's dog food involved. Let's talk about the setup here for what's going to be a big part of our opening match. During the summer, we see a sit down shoot style interview with Mick Foley. And he's talking to good old Jr. And he's talking about his upbringing and how as a youngster, he wanted to be dude love. And we see video footage of him cutting promos as this dude love character, which is a heartthrob baby face. And Mick wrote in his book, I was surprised one evening to hear Bruce Pritchard say, you know, we're going to make a dude love shirt. 
Were you the first person who saw that? Well, yeah, I was probably, well, I was one of the first people that ever heard the story of dude love as far as I know in, in that dressing room. So we were in Toronto and it was myself, Sean Michaels. Uh, I think Hunter might've been there. Pat Patterson. I don't know if Taker was there, but it was after, it was after the matches and Mick was talking about something. He was talking to Sean and Sean was saying something along the lines of, you know, Cactus Jack and, uh, mankind and that type of character. And Mick made a comment along the lines of goes, well, Sean, growing up, I always wanted to be somebody like you. I wanted to be the hot baby face that all the girls loved. As a matter of fact, when I was a kid, I did promos and my friend and, and he had his, his friend like Jim Cornette had Kenny Bolin. Mick had his friend, whatever his name was. They used to play wrestle and cut promos. And he goes, my name was dude love. And I, I, I saw myself in, in my eyes. I was you. And we all got a good laugh out of it. Mick telling this story. I went back and shared the story with Vince. I said, can you imagine this deal? And, and Mick Foley, the human being has such an interesting story that that's how the three faces of Foley came about. And we started going into the Mick Foley, the cactus Jack, and then eventually dude love that it was so damn rich. Every kid can imagine being in their basement and cutting promos and being some character they create. So I was like, yeah, we're going to do dude love. And he thought I was ribbing him. He thought I was just completely fucking with him. He wrote in his book that he received a surprise phone call from Vince who said, Hey pal, how would you like to be dude love? And he didn't know what to say. He assumed he meant for the next pay-per-view and Vince said, no, I mean, from now on. And of course, Foley was really digging the way mankind was going. And he says that Vince said, I'm not saying we can't ever go back there, but fans will love this dude love story. It's such a great PR story. Regis and Kathy Lee would love something like this. You know, children will love him. Fans who already love mankind will love him. And people won't be afraid to bring their girlfriends to the matches because dude won't threaten them. He's a safe sex symbol, which is hilarious to me. Um, Vince would say, we'll play it up huge girls, pyro. We're even going to team you up with Steve and here you go. The summer of love was born and he gets new entrance music and the whole deal. When you guys first roll out, dude, love, does anybody think who booked this shit or is this a rib? At first, I think Mick thought it was a rib, but once, once you saw how he played it and how over the top it was. Damn. It, it was like, you know, you're getting two characters for the price of one, three characters for the price of one, four characters. When you throw in Mick, um, it was, it was interesting storytelling and it was something people could now identify with Mick Foley because I think everybody could relate to that guy that wanted to be somebody else growing up. And now he's realizing his dream. First match is a cage match. We're getting this one started in a big way. Mankind and Hunter Hearst Helmsley have been on a collision course here and China is on the outside, but that's not going to keep her from interfering, whether there are chains involved or, um, slamming the door on his head. They're pulling out all the stops here, but the big spot is it looks like mankind is going to win. He climbs over the top of the cage, almost down to the floor. And at the very bottom of the cage, which stops at the top of the ring apron, he looks up and then decides to take his mask off, throw it over into the ring and then climb back up, tear the top of his mankind top, and then drop the big elbow. Just like dude love would do. It's a pretty cool moment. Of course, eventually they play the dude love music and two and a half stars is where we get, um, what'd you think Meltzer says that, uh, the match had its hot spots and memorable spots and in hindsight was very well laid out, but something was missing from the body of the match and it just didn't have heat. And I don't know that I dis I don't know that I necessarily disagree with, you know, the crowd wasn't responding maybe the way they could have, because I remembered this match much more fondly than the way they received it. Then I was sort of shocked with the way it was received when I watched it back 20 something years later. I thought it was a good match. I thought it was a solid match. There were just funny spots in it where at the top, when Mick Foley was climbing over the top of the cage, 
and China climbs up on the outside of the cage to stop him. She goes to <laughs> Mick has his ass basically in her face and China goes, I don't know what the hell she was trying to do, but she basically punches him in the ass. And for those of us backstage, everybody popped because it was just a funny sight the way he sold it and Mick going back in the ring from an ass punch, but also watching it back all these years later in the psychology sometimes, especially for a heel where Hunter had Mick completely beat in the ring. All he had to do was walk out the door, but I'm going to go back for more punishment. And the psychology killed me on, on some of those spots uh, for Mick to do it at the end and do the superfly spot and Mick to eventually go over. I'm fine with that. Um, but the also the other thing that for years everybody talked about was China slamming the cage door of Big Blue on Mick Foley's head. And I don't care who you are. That fucking cage was the stiffest son of a bitch ever made. And there was no way to protect yourself or, or cushion that shot. And that was one of those that for guys that have been in the Big Blue cage, they cringe every time they see it. Wade Keller, I'm sorry, not Wade Keller. Mick Foley actually wrote about it in his book that China swung that cage door as hard as she could, which is the way he insisted that she do things like that, but that it fucking nailed him and gave him a concussion. And he said it hurt so bad that he didn't even hold his head. He held his shoulder because he had shooting pains down his arm, but that wasn't the only head trauma he suffered here. There's a spot in the match where Hunter slams his head into the cage 10 times unanswered. And about every other time it leaves a lump on his head. So he wakes up the next day, all lumped up and in a bad way. But of course he finished the match, got his big super fly moment. And if, as if that wasn't obvious from him climbing and you know, the, the heart tattoo and the, I love you hand signal, Jim Ross is putting it over really big and helping you at home sort of connect the dots. Did you talk to Mick afterwards? This is sort of you know, his first big breakout moment about him achieving his boyhood dream of sorts. What did he think of the match afterwards? You know, immediately, I think Mick was pleased with it. I think it was a big deal for him to be in a cage match and quote the New York market and be able to do that spot off the cage, which is what he wanted to do was that big elbow off the top. I think both guys were pleased with the match and there was nothing not to be pleased with. It told a Good story. Psychology wise, I might've changed a few things, but again, that's looking at a hindsight. Well, let's get to it. While we're really here, the main event, before we do, I want to encourage everybody go watch the promo right before the match. It's uh, in the dressing room area. Shawn Michaels is going to do a, probably an off the cuff, non-scripted promo with Kevin Kelly. And he, uh, you can tell he's not happy that the promo goes a little longer than it should. He felt like maybe it would be shorter if you're reading the body language. Um, and at one point he says, you know, these mind games would work on me if I had anything as far as a mind or something like that, but there's just not a lot up there. And it reminds me of a friend of ours wrote that. who recently said, my daughter's not as dumb as she looks, which is just a great all time home run line. I never said that. No, of course not. Anyway, go watch the interview. It's hilarious. And it will remind you by the way, that, uh, everybody gets better. Evolution is a thing. Shawn Michaels retained the WWF title beating mankind in 26 minutes and 25 seconds. Mankind's brought to the ring in a casket by Druids and boy, they pull out all the stops. This was a really, really good match. You and I watched it again. You know, I still wish they had a clean finish. Of course, at the end, Vader's going to run in for the DQ, but they do the big table spot. We teased it last week. Mankind peels the mats back. It looks like he's going to be setting up something for Sean on the concrete. Instead, Sean just covers him back up with those same mats and jumps up and down on him. It's a silly little spot, but it really works. And they even have a spot where Sean Michaels does like the, um, the Sabu style. Hey, I'm going to get a run running start, jump off a chair and then almost Rob Van Dam Van Daminator, a chair into mankind's head. They pulled out a lot of really cool stuff in that match. I dug it. The use of the steps with Foley, just brutal stuff. what do you think of the match? I thought the match was excellent. Very innovative. And, uh, it was a lot of, it was a lot of first times, uh, look, table tables weren't a thing every week. 
uh, back then. They were something that wasn't used, especially in WWE. Mankind being a very unique character at the time that had an unorthodox style that wasn't something that you would say, hey, man, here's going to be this this catch as catch can match, uh, classic wrestling match. No, it was going to be a little dirty and it was going to be a little ugly. And everything about it to me was intriguing. Even to this day, it holds up as an absolute excellent match. I dare say the best match Mick Foley's ever had in his life. I think Foley wrote in his book that he thought it was his best match too. And Meltzer would say a super match. But the week ending kept it from being the match of the year. He gave it four and three quarter stars. I too would have liked to have seen a clean finish. I don't think we needed Undertaker or Sid or Vader or any of the extra shenanigans. The match itself was good. There was one spot though where he got something from uh, Paul Bear and started stabbing himself in the leg with it. They explained on commentary it was a pencil. No, JR immediately went, he's stabbing himself with a pencil. And it's a, a white. <laughs> wrapped up piece of tape and how would you know that's a pencil how would you know that's a pencil tell me about the spot in the match that you took issue with it looked like a miscommunication it looked like there was going to be an irish whip and then perhaps mankind was going to follow him he did not sean teased that he was going to surprise him with a crossbody splash but of course he looked and realized he's not there so he ran over to him and as he made the approach, you could tell the guys were like, well, what now? And that guy just slaps him. And you were like, be sure to ask me about that. So here I am. Well, because, again, during that time, uh, we'd had the Vader match with Sean. At SummerSlam. At SummerSlam. That was the last pay-per-view. And there was a miscommunication in that match that everybody was on Sean about. And, oh, Sean's got such a bad attitude. And, and uh you know, he's unprofessional this and he's unprofessional that. And how dare he do that to Vader and all this other crap. In laying out the match, uh, the idea was brought up to, hey, what if we had a miscommunication like in the Vader match? On purpose. On purpose. And yet, ev and everybody picked it up, including your uh, buddy there, uh, picked it up. Oh, Sean being a dick again. Sean being unprofessional again with a miscommunication in a match. And it was all built in. It was all built in to tell a story. So actually, Meltzer didn't write about it. I bet he did. He did not. I just read the whole review. Okay. Well, he talked about it. But there is a, that spot has been talked about by both Sean and Foley, where they planned it off of the miscommunicated spot at SummerSlam. <laughs> Uh, but you liked it. You liked that. That was sort of a callback. If you were paying attention. Yeah, I uh, did. I loved it. And I thought it was very well done. And yeah, Meltzer did bite and did, did talk about it during that time. Well, not in the right. Maybe up for just that Cause match. you can't find it in your research. I just read the whole review. Okay. I'm oh. just saying in his, in his talking about things at the time. Oh, so that, so you're saying y'all would plan spots to intentionally fool Meltzer and no, ha ha. It was actually something that people were talking about, and it was one of the things that the boys were talking about kind of as we got into Sean and looking at Sean's whole, um, not, not the work, but it was a frustrated Sean. You know, as a, as a talent and as a champion, and is, is the championship getting to be too much for Sean? Because where before Shawn Michaels would have been on his game and would have gone flawlessly through this, you're seeing a frustrated Shawn and to work that into the story. Why don't you think we saw more of Shawn and Mankind together? I mean, it feels like they had natural chemistry. You know, the whole dude love story that we're going to learn where, where Mankind really thought he would be Shawn Michaels, where Foley aspired to be what Shawn Michaels became as a youngster. But we didn't get like a series of matches like we did with Sean and Undertaker. And we know that Sean and Undertaker are just going to have an incredible series of matches a year later, you know, the fall of 97. But we don't see that series of matches. And this one, God, what a great match. It was a great match. And, you know, there was talk about a program. But again, everybody else had different dancing partners. And you're thinking, oh, I'm going to get this a year down the line. And then Sean got hurt a year down the line, a yep. year, you know, literally a year, uh, less than that. You. It was in September. Wasn't it? When the casket match, were oh, that was January Royal rumble. But what you're talking about is he lost his smile the coming February. 
Okay, well, it was it was either a, way. Sean either was way, a whole, We were looking at it. We'll get it. We'll get it down the road. It just didn't happen. Yeah. Uh, in hindsight, you know, twenty twenty. It's hindsight's always twenty twenty. Do you think? No, it's twenty twenty one. Sure. Do you think you should have had a clean finish here, or do you are you happy with what we saw? No, I'm happy with what we saw because you kind of had to protect mankind, and obviously you couldn't take the title off of Sean. And it was an excellent match. I don't think there was one person that was disappointed in that you didn't have a clean one, two, three in that match. So Jim has talked about before. Jr. has talked about before. He was hesitant to sign Foley. He just didn't see it. And now he's had an incredible feud with the undertaker, arguably the best match in the company that year in 1996. I know a lot of, you know, idiots would think that it was Sean and Brett from WrestleMania 12, but that match sucked. Greatest Uh, match ever. Yep. Yep. Uh, is Vince all high fives afterwards? Holy shit. Look what we've got here. And Mick Foley. I think, yeah, I think that it was all of a sudden that Mick wasn't a, a a monster one trick pony with, Big man undertaker. Um, he had different speeds that he had, that he was able to perform. He was able to li- to deliver. But I think that Vince saw that in the undertaker matches enough that he had the confidence to put him in the main event spot with Sean. Well, Sean happy with the match. We know that Foley calls it one of his best matches ever. I remember uh, Sean being ecstatic. That's awesome. I only ask because, you know, as the legend goes, he thought at times Vader could be stiff and perhaps that mask was a little smelly and Foley has said the exact same thing that his mask, because it was leather, there's only so much he could do with that. It was not going to be fresh as a daisy. Yeah. But, but Mick wasn't stinky. Like, right. Yeah. So I don't remember Mick being, well, anyway, thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs in the middle. What do you get? Thumbs up. I mean, the, the show's probably best remembered for the ECW angle and the main event. But even without the ECW angle, I think people would still be talking about that that main event. I mean, what a match. The main event was excellent. I thought Taker Goldust was damn good. SummerSlam 2005 is our topic today after a bunch of rambling mess at the top of the show. But we're going to start the build for SummerSlam on the July 4th episode. we got Cena and Chris Jericho brawling during a highlight reel, and that's going to start the WWE title program. We've also got Shawn Michaels and Hulk Hogan teaming up to defeat Kurt Angle and Carlito. But afterwards at the celebration, Shawn Michaels super kicks Hulk Hogan and we're off to the races. We've got a new program. Talk to me a little bit about what was the work that went into putting together Shawn turning heel against Hogan and the whole program itself. Was there any hesitation from either guy on either side or did these two trust each other from the beginning and then it deteriorated? How does this all come together? And I assume that part of the lesson that we learned at WrestleMania 18 was if you're going to put Hogan with somebody, fans are going to cheer him. So he can't be the heel. Like we tried to make him against the rock. The fans wanted him babyface. So if somebody's going to turn heel in this scenario, it can't be Hulk. Do I have that right? Well, I think that in looking at it, there was an initial reaction that do you need to turn either guy? And the feeling being that, and In reality, I think there were just going to be, and there were Sean fans and there were Hulk fans. The overall feeling of this was taking the guy from the eighties and the guy from the nineties and putting them against one another because each had their own legion of followers and fans and what have you. So it was kind of a natural, but I don't think that, I don't think that really you had to turn anybody and Sean could do heelish things. Hogan did do heelish things and their fans forgave them. And the other person's fans despised them for that. So it was just kind of playing into both men's personalities and not making a full fledged. Oh my God, this guy's got to be a heel. Yeah, we got there, but uh, even as we got there, I think it was still divided somewhat. When when this is first proposed, whose idea is this? And do you remember both Hogan and Sean being receptive to it? In the beginning, yeah, both were, were very receptive to it. 
and I, you know, it was a conglomeration of the writing team and getting to this match. And it might have been Michael Hayes even that first suggested the match, best of my recollection. But it was something that everybody was saying, if we could only get to this, shit, this could be good. Because, again, you, you had the two heroes from two different eras. What was the relationship like in 05 here, uh, you know, July, August 05, with Hogan and Vince? It feels like over the years they've sort of played hokey pokey. They've had their ups and downs. Were they on good terms here, or, or did it feel like Hogan in this era still had one foot out the door at all times? I think especially during the times that Hulk came back that there was always that feeling of, you know, what's the trigger going to be this time? And for Hulk and Vince, look, they had, you know, like any relationship, they had good times and they had bad times. So throughout this, it was post-WrestleMania, so you're looking at, okay, is somebody going to be upset at payoffs or anything else? Or is it time to take the summer off? So you had to weigh in all of that shit. And overall, I think that in the middle of this, in the meat of this, I think that Vince and, and Hulk had a pretty good relationship. It's just weird to know that, you know, he was here before during the, the whole rock thing. That was oh two oh three, but then he leaves. He winds up actually doing a show with New Japan. Teases like he's going to do some stuff with uh, with TNA in oh three, and did the whole attack with Jared at the press conference. But then when he goes into the Hall of Fame in April of oh five, it feels like, hey man, we're we're back in it. And we had that big WrestleMania moment with. It just feels like we're trying it again, but we're not. We're not really here for the long haul. Was that sort of the vibe you got as well? I think every time that you tried it, you were wishing you were. You were wishing that, man, this is it, and and we can take it to the house. You know what I mean? It's like, ah, finally, this is the one. Just things work out differently sometimes. It's It's interesting, too, because we've heard over the years, you know, and certainly Sean and Vince had their ups and downs, but it certainly feels like, Sean and Vince have had a much tighter relationship as a whole than Vince and Hogan. And it feels like, I don't know, this has got to be a special match even for Vince. Yeah, I think so. Because again, you look at the, the, the creations and what they meant to the company and overall the support of the different fan groups throughout the years, there were loyalists on every single side, which made it a natural and Hulk had that overreaching just to, to, to everyone knew who the hell Hulk Hogan was. I think probably to this day, most people still do. Um, so yeah, it was, this was one of those that you, you needed to get while you had both of them on the books. You know, we talked a little bit about Hogan turning or, or Sean turning heel. And you said you weren't sure that you had to turn anybody heel. Why did you ultimately decide on we, somebody does have to be the bad guy for us to tell this story and it's going to be Sean. And, and is, is there ever any consideration for it being Hogan and was Sean, you know, just glad to be the heel. I think that again, just as I said before, as far as turning heel and what people would consider turning heel was, to their, to their audience and to their fans, they weren't turning heel. They were saying everything that was true, and they were doing what they wanted them to do. So both sides, to me, both sides, both guys, in a traditional sense, turned heel. Well, yeah, and, and to your point, and we've talked about this before, but the best like movie villains don't believe that they're bad guys. They believe in what they're doing. And yeah, they may have some interesting ways of, of getting the job done, but their motivation is their belief, which is something that they, that like, they're not waking up thinking I'm going to go do bad things today. No, they say, Hey, I'm going to rob a bank today and that sucks, but I'm not going to try to hurt anybody, but I'm doing that to take care of my wife or kids or whatever. But they believe that they they're doing, maybe they're doing bad things, but they're doing them for the right reason. If that makes sense. Or they don't even necessarily believe that what they're doing is bad as, right. as much as ne necessary. 
Right. Raw the next week from Philadelphia has uh, Shawn Michaels and Hulk Hogan make their SummerSlam match official. I mean, there was never any consideration for anything else headlining, right? This was always going to be the main event? In our head, yes. Uh, I mean, that that was... You look at that, and that's a damn attractive headliner. So, yes, in our head, it definitely was. Do you think you started to have that in mind, like WrestleMania? We've heard way back in the day, you know, early 90s, late 80s, you would try to look at, like, WrestleMania to WrestleMania. But as you start adding all these other pay-per-views, it feels like you start to think about your more major ones. Yes, we've got minor pay-per-views, sort of B-shows, if there is such a thing, along the way. But the big pillars of the company being, you know, WrestleMania and Survivor Series and Royal Rumble and SummerSlam, when he comes back and you see the reception and how well he's received and it seems like things are clicking along, do you sort of have Hogan, Sean, in your mind's eye as a main event for SummerSlam coming off of WrestleMania? Or do you think that's more of a May-June type thing? No, it was more of a June-July type thing. It definitely wasn't immediate. I think that with Hulk coming back at WrestleMania at that time was a feeling out period and to see a, how Hulk would be, how the audience would be and what we would have moving forward. Uh, The July 25th raw is pretty memorable. It's got a spoof of Hulk Hogan being on Larry King live, except it's Shawn Michaels doing his own. Uh, Wade would clarify. He says, for the record, Shawn Michaels comments on the July 25th raw raw in the pre-taped Larry King live spoof this week were all scripted and approved by Vince McMahon. There was no breaking from the agreed upon talking points. Michaels never planned to, nor wanted to turn full fledged heel as he entered the program with Hogan, uh, culminating at SummerSlam In early discussions about the match. Hogan suggested that Michael super kick Nick either at SummerSlam or as part of an angle on raw before the pay-per-view. But Michaels resisted the angle in part because he didn't want to be that strong of a heel. And also because he felt the match between them didn't need the extra stuff to get over. His attitude is that bells and whistles aren't necessary given their statures in the industry. And it's their first time against each other. A lot to unpack here. Do you remember one of the ideas being kicked around that Nick could take a super kick? <laughs> I, I don't, but I'm sure it was, uh, I look. There were a lot of things, but you didn't need it. Right. You really didn't need it. The match, the first time, was enough. Right. It was as simple of a build as you could possibly get. Two icons coming together for the first time. Two different eras colliding for the first time. What's going to happen? What do you remember about the Shawn Michaels spoof on Larry King live. Would you have been producing that or would someone else have? Maybe. Oh God, help me, Bruce. (laughs) Uh, I had a hand in it. And the, I think that the best part to me was the ungodly layers of spray tan that we put on Shawn was just hilarious. And then I became jealous because he was just so dark and that fucking tan. God. Um, but no, it was a lot of fun and, and everything that we, everything we did on it was 100% calculated and done for a reason. Tremendous. We're going to play the audio from it because I think it's just one of my favorite parodies ever. Roddy Piper's hosting a Piper's pit with Shawn Michaels discussing the Michael super kick on Hogan, but it ends with Michaels hitting Piper with a super kick of his own. Was Roddy easy to put this promo together or is it two guys that you knew didn't have to be scripted or what can you tell us about, you know, working with Piper and Hogan in this era? <laughs> well, I don't think Roddy was ever easy to script. Roddy wasn't a script guy, but at the same time he became he became one that would look at what you had and try to make it his own and did a damn good job of doing that. So you you had to bal- you had a balancing act with Roddy. You had to write something that you knew that he could tweak and that you knew that he could make his own and pray that he didn't go too far off into the woods. Um, Sean, you give Sean the points and Sean's going to, 
<laughs> going to get it all in for you. The, the biggest thing here is, is that the, the view that Roddy had of himself and his outlook is, okay, you know, where's my program? What, what am I going to be doing then on the other side of this? And, and this was during a time that we were really trying to, for Roddy's own health, get Roddy out of the ring. And I just don't, you know, it, there wasn't plans. Maybe you could have had something with Roddy and Sean, but it definitely wasn't in the cards at that point. On the August 8th edition of Raw, we've got a main event of Matt Hardy in his first WWE match back. He's going to defeat Gene Snitsky here, and uh, Edge is going to attack him afterwards to keep their program building. And it also features Chris Jericho defeating referee Chad Patton because Patton counted a pin on Carlito the week before in a match against John Cena. That's good shit, man. I, I like it, the idea of, of a wrestler versus a referee. That's pretty creative here. Well, thank you. You're welcome. That's probably Brian Gerwitz's idea. Yeah. I didn't think he came up with anything that Yeah, good. no. Uh, Kurt Angle is going to attack Eugene after a match to get his gold medals back. And Eugene saved, of course. And, uh, we set up a new match the, the, between Hogan and Angle. Why would Hogan and Angle be put on free TV? Just because it was, you didn't see it as really a, uh, a pay-per-view match and it should just be a television attraction. No, it's uh, again, I think that during this time, you're kind of looking at uh, television and providing the best television that you can too. And it wasn't a 20, 30 minute big television match. I think Hogan would have asked the questions like, why in the fuck am I ever in here with this guy? God damn. He hurts. Uh, <laughs> But it, it just made sense. And, and it was, again, it wasn't a, a big, gigantic match. Well, the match, I mean. It was like, oh, hey, yes, it's a great attraction for one time. And we could have gotten to an angle and a story with them. But this was kind of a one-off, nice step in the story. You want to talk about a promo. Man, go out of your way. To see the 20 minute all out heel promo in Montreal, right before SummerSlam, uh, Wade would say it's the best heel promo of Sean's entire career. Nobody wants to boo him more than Montreal and boy, he played into it in a big way. Uh, Wade would write Michael played into that and seemed more comfortable in his skin behind the mic as a heel than at any time since becoming born again without being raunchy. Michaels was a cocky jerk again, unabashedly. And they even do a little tease where they, they tease Bret Hart's music in Montreal. This is just great stuff. What do you remember about this promo in Montreal? Well, it was also the point where you looked at it and you said, okay, let, let's go stronger with this because in traditional media, if you will, out there, say Larry King or whatever else, and anybody else that was doing publicity on this show, the guys are throwing jabs back and forth, and we had been pretty careful on the television show how we handled that. And then it became, well, fuck, we just need to go there. Go. Go, go out and, and to, to me... I didn't look at it as a heel promo. I looked at it as the truth. Well, and, and that's, what's so great about it is the crowd hates him, right? So they're chanting the Nana Na song at him when he's in the middle of a promo. I mean, they're basically saying, okay, we're done with you. Go away. So he just lays down in the ring and does nothing. And after about 30 seconds, when they stop singing and start booing, he jumps up and says, now that you understand who's running this show, I'll continue. It's just really great stuff. And he even says, Hulk Hogan, the same thing I despise about you is the same thing I despise about Bret Hart, but you know, that's going to get some heat here. You stood for some moral fiber that in your real life did not exist. Yet you stood in judgment of me. You Hulk Hogan will stand for just about anything. There isn't a realistic bone in your body. And Wade would say that comment was not only meant once again, to point out the fact that Hogan may portray himself as pure and good, but he's a hypocrite in reality. That comment also harkened back to Michael's suggestive sunny days promo years prior at Bret Hart, 
which was getting under his skin, of course. He concluded, Hulk Hogan, you're the biggest star in WWE history, and at SummerSlam, I want you to bring your big star. I want you to wear your boa. I want you to have your sunglasses on, and I want you to have your chin high. Your one move from your star being snuffed out. Don't ask me. Don't believe me. Just ask Bret Hart. And, of course, more heat here. Just really, really great stuff. At this point, how contentious is the real-life Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, Hulk Hogan? I mean, it feels like Shawn's firing off everywhere. Maybe some of this, since Bret is coming back into the fold for a DVD, is okay and approved. But it's adding a lot of fire to this Hogan-Shawn thing now. What's their relationship like as we get closer and closer to SummerSlam? Let's make money. You're in Montreal. You're you're in you're in a, a market that still remembers a finish from years and years and years ago. I mean, it was over ten years ago at that point, and you have a guy that came out after uh, his WrestleMania with Rock in Montreal, and they gave they gave the guy like a twelve minute standing ovation. Right. So why not use all of that in this market to, to bring it bring it to the surface? It's what everybody wanted to hear. There, there, there's, there's an audience there. They, they want to hear that shit. And it's exactly what the Hogan faithful didn't want to hear. Did you put Christmas on a credit card? Don't stress out about that extra holiday spending. SaveWithConrad.com can help you consolidate all of your high interest rate credit cards into one much lower monthly payment. SaveWithConrad.com has helped families just like yours save up to $800 a month. You don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket. And did I mention no payments until March? So don't make saving money a resolution next year. Make it happen today at SaveWithConrad.com. Let's talk about January 31st. We've had so many requests to talk about this. It's halftime heat. This is such a big deal. It's a match from the WWF happening in the middle of the Super Bowl. Of course, it's not the actual Super Bowl. You had to change channels, but still don't watch the silly halftime show. Flip it over here and watch halftime heat. The rock is going to defend his world title against mankind. And of all things, an empty arena match. And you're welcome. In 99, that felt like a really big deal. Now it's called Monday. Um, tell me what you remember about halftime heat, whose idea it was, how it came to be, and uh, what you thought of the actual execution here. Well, the opportunity arose to do something. Uh, there was. I believe it was MTV that might have done it first that put on alternate musical act and a different show that was advertised. Hey, this is not going to start until the Super Bowl goes goes into halftime. But over here, you know, there you can watch Madonna or whoever. But over here, we've got Aerosmith. We've got the Rolling Stones. We, it was it was interesting. So why not play into that and work with our partners to try and say, hey, let's grab some of that audience that's watching the Super Bowl that may not be interested in what they have during halftime because that could be a time that people get up and go and shit and fart and get some more pizza and beer. Um, let's give them something else to watch. Help that, you know, we taped it. Obviously, uh, we didn't have to sit there and wait and go live and worry about those cues. We taped it and made it perfect. But uh, I thought it was a hell of an idea, and it, and it was something that I thought worked really well. The empty arena match was something that had been done in Memphis with Jerry Lawler and Terry Funk. My eye! Good God, Lance, my eye! Your mother's a poor Lawler. Um, egg sucking dog. Uh, so it was, it was something that had been done before and thought it was the perfect foil for Mick and rock. It's really a cool innovation. 
you know, it's not really an innovation as you sort of alluded to. It's the old Terry Funk, Jerry Lawler, but there's a whole generation of folks who never saw it. What did Vince think of an empty arena match? Uh, well, back in the day, it was called WCW, but, um, just thought, what well, you know, it was a different presentation and we were able to dress it up enough that you tell the story of why it was an empty arena match. And the reason it was an empty arena match was so there wouldn't be any interference and, and just make this between these two. And it's, it's so heated uh situation. I don't know. I loved it. I loved it because it was a little bit nostalgic for me and having loved the Lawler Terry Funk deal. And I really did want to get, and Mick did too. We, we wanted to get an homage to Terry Funk in there somehow, some way. So it was fun. I, I just thought it was a great idea that people in, in this generation, certainly on a national level, had never seen before. It is kind of fun. You've got Vince on commentary for quote unquote heat, which is obviously not the norm. Why did Vince feel like he should do commentary just to explain the storylines and nobody can sell it quite like he can, or what's the thing? Well, that, and also, you know, you've got the corporation here and rock being a part of that and be able to put that heel character, Mr. McMahon out there. Plus it lended a bit of credibility to the match that if you were going to get some outside, you know, outside of our norm viewers on a Sunday afternoon or Sunday early evening that are tuning in to sample this, that don't want to watch football and they're clicking through seeing what's on. And all of a sudden you've got these two guys beating the shit out of each other in an empty arena. Uh, Vince, Vince helped in that regard with that character. The, uh, funny thing in this whole commentary is when the rock or yeah, the rock takes a, dr- a swig of Jack Daniels, McMahon claims that's not real liquor. The rock doesn't drink. It's just, just fucking hilarious. Uh, there is the, but in reality, it probably fell out of Jr's bag, but he drinks crown Royal. Everybody listening to this knows he'll that. drink whatever the fuck you got. All right, let's run a timeout right now. What's the heat with Jr. No heat with Jr. I love Jr. I love busting his balls, but I love Jr. There is absolutely less than zero heat with Jr. Love him to death, always have, and always will. At one point, I just like fucking with him. Oh, I know. He likes fucking with you back. Um, at one point, mankind rolls down forty rows of seats. This is the big spot. Does anybody try to talk him out of that? As best you recall. Not necessarily talk him out of it, but just wonder how the fuck are you going to accomplish this? Because it was ugly. It was ugly. And and just, man, that's hard to do. Go down, taking bumps down steps and, and through all that shit. You just don't know. And Mick takes those awkward, crazy bumps that makes it even better in, in so many ways. And... It was just be careful. He assured everybody he knew what the hell he was doing when in reality, he probably didn't. But that's the mystique of Mick Foley. Let's get back to the show. The, uh, they've got a, a food fight. This feel, <laughs> this feels like, uh, this has got Bruce Pritchard all over it. Is it Bruce who loves the food fight shit or is it Vince? Oh no, it's Vince. Vince, Vince loves him some food fighting. If there is, if there is any scene that goes through any place that has food and beverage, that shit's going to be used. It's remarkable that Vince is enamored with it. Now, listen, there's been a lot of criticism over the years and it even happens a little in this match. Guys are selling shots from popcorn. Now I understand that a live event. Have you ever fucking been hit with a bag of popcorn? At least once a year. Okay. Well, sometimes that shit gets in your eye. And like, if you get hit with the edge of a kernel, it could cause a very, very bad scratch that could possibly get infected. If you scratched it too much and that salt gets under your skin, the worst, 
the worst is right. Let me ask legitimately. Was there any sort of, um, is it, is it, are guys just like, you know, ha ha in the back or if there's some old timers who were like, what the fuck is this? It was an empty arena. There was no one there. To sell. God damn it, Bruce. You know what I mean? When you're selling popcorn, why are you being so difficult? Hey, well, okay. Also see, this is the other thing that we didn't get a reveal was inside that popcorn bag was two pounds of lead. Okay. Thank you. But listen, say that on the fucking show. Next time you have somebody sell mashed potatoes. Okay. <laughs> These mashed potatoes have gluten. I don't know. He's got an allergy. <laughs> God damn it. Oh my God. <laughs> it's full of gluten. <laughs> He's covered in gluten as God is my witness. Good. God, they just are peanut butter cookies and he's got allergies. <laughs> That's at least something, you know? Hey, so the most criticized thing of the whole match though, is the silly angle when they use a forklift and they've got beer kegs on a forklift, mankind magically knows how to work a forklift and he's going to lower these onto rock's chest. They're not going to show the impact. Of course, what they are going to show though, is the camera angle where the camera is on the forklift coming down at the rock and the rock was, uh, selling it big as you might imagine, but mankind was pretty critical of that shot and said he thought it ruined the whole thing. what do you think of that last shot that has now become, I don't know, debated. Maybe that's the right word. Yeah. You know, it gets into essentially you know, what, what, what do you like? And what I mean by that is it's entertainment. Right. So you, you can allow suspend your disbelief and just sit back and enjoy it. Who the fuck cares where the camera came from? So it's another angle. It's something else. And people forget sometimes that we're entertainment and you can take liberties so to me, that's just another, it's another way to present what the hell we're doing and didn't bother me. What's not a miss is the ladder match for the intercontinental championships next. And man, these guys have their work cut out for them. 10 years prior to this at WrestleMania 10, two guys went out and had the most famous ladder match ever, Scott Hall and Shawn Michaels. And now in front of that same audience, they're trying to top it, but with a different style ladder match, we've talked about this a lot. The physicality here has been getting stepped up week after week on the August 17th episode of raw DX and the nation fighting a street fight, which the nation wins, but rock rams a ladder in a triple H's face. So he's bleeding from the mouth. Here we go. Now we've got a ladder match and Hunter gets the win after 26 minutes and Meltzer would write, they had this seven and a half foot ladder stationary that I figured they were going to name Silva. Helmsley sold his knee, which he had an MRI done on earlier in the week, but not as much as you'd think. There was nothing spectacular along the lines of the Shawn Michaels ladder bumps that some ladder matches are famous for in the WWF, but this was the match that stole the show. Some of the spots where the guys were climbing the ladder were way too slow, but other than that, the effort was tremendous. My V got great heat for working on Helmsley's leg. He continues to give a rundown, but it's a glowing review from there from Meltzer. He gave it four and a quarter stars. He would write, even though he was a heel, you could really sense my via had totally won the crowd over as being a great performer with this match. You and I have touched on this before. And I think a lot of people looked at this as sort of the barometer and both of these guys are poised to be a top guy. Who is it going to be? And while Hunter won the match, it feels like Rocky won him over because Hunter wins the IC title, but in just a handful of months, the rock's going to be the world title. Is this the match that sort of made the rock for Vince McMahon? He was rock was already on his way, but you go back and you look at the entire presentation of this match. We had Chris Warren and the DX band come out and sing Hunter out into the ring. And I forgot, you know, you hear that song so many times, but to hear Chris do it here, they had the band. I thought it was one of the best renditions ever. 
Um, let me just tell you, I go the other way. I thought this was a studio song. I thought the live performance sucked. I know that, you know, I loved it. he's no longer with us and I shouldn't shit on it, but I'm just saying I did not fucking like the live performance. I much preferred the actual recorded version. Why did you like the live so much? I, I loved it because the some bitch could sing and I liked the, just the raw guitar and everything in there. I, it was different. And I liked those guys being out in the ring and it was, and it was different and it was good. I liked trashing all the instruments afterwards and the whole presentation was different and it was unique. Then you get into the match and it, it's symbolic because the match was different and unique. It wasn't the high flying suicidal bumps. It told a story and they started that story from the rock taken out triple H's knee. So you, you knew about the knee earlier on in the night. You, you told that story. They had something to work and it just goes to show that you don't have to do all those crazy bumps. You don't have to do all the over the top theatrics to tell a great story and have a great match and get people invested in the product. And that's what they did here. They told you a different, a different story in a ladder match. And everybody believed it and everybody got into it. And it was logical. Um, I got to laugh at the, oh, well, they climbed up the, the ladder too slow. And I'm watching this match and watching the guys go up the ladder. First of all, I'm terrified of heights. And I have been on a ladder in the ring. So me going up a ladder in general on stable ground is terrifying for me. And I go up it slower than what they were doing in the ring, but to do it in a ring where it's shaky and there's things going on, but it also is the, the drama of a match. You're telling a goddamn story here, folks. So it's that inch by inch. He crawls and he climbs and is he going to get there? Is he not going to get there? So that's always funny to me when these people go, Oh, go. First of all, go try and climb a ladder in a ring while somebody's bouncing around and the damn thing's given on every step. That's terrifying in, in and of itself. And at the end of the match, when the referee climbs up the ladder about three steps to raise Hunter's hand, and you see Hunter grab the grab the ladder like, dude, <laughs> what the fuck? I'm on top here. It's it's just it was unstable. But again, I say all that to say the match was great, and they told a hell of a story. I, I somehow goofed up there and said that that WrestleMania 10 match was 10 years prior. I guess I was thinking about WrestleMania 20. There's only a handful of years here. You know, you're talking about 94 versus 98. Were there concerns? Maybe not from a rock standpoint, but Hunter, I mean, he, he obviously knew what that ladder match meant to Sean and the company. Were there concerns as to whether or not they could pull it off and that they had to sort of do something different? Cause they knew it really couldn't compete if they tried to just copycat. Not really. They were, prepared to go out and tell their own story. And it wasn't, Oh, I'm going to go out and try and outdo what they did. They were going to go out and tell their own story and have the best match for their story. And, and that's what they did. And I think that it held up in comparison, different, just they're different mm -hmm. matches, different performers. Why do you think their feud isn't really talked about more than it is? They had a hell of a feud in 98. I mean, with the whole spoofing, that they did where DX spoofed the nation. And that's been super controversial because you got white dudes and blackface and, but they feud it compared, all. But uh, not talked about compared to what? And well, I just mean like, you know, I feel like it gets glossed over a little bit in this era. I mean, they did a two out of three falls match at fully loaded. I mean, there's a, a whole string of matches here where they're working together. And in the end, I guess, you know, Hunter wins the series, but rock wins the push. What was their relationship like behind the scenes at this time? You know, they weren't going out and having a beer at the end of the night. I don't, they weren't friends, but they were professionals that worked together. And, you know, to me, this is one of the issues and angles that I constantly, uh, bring up to young talent is an example of hard work and an example of being real because they didn't like each other. And right. so many of the promos that you heard, man, they, they were shooting with each other in a lot of ways. They made it real and you felt it. So uh, that's why I, I was saying compared to what, because to me, 
it's one of the just angles and, and, and it's one of the rivalries that does live on kind of like Austin McMahon. And I do look at rock and triple H as is, is being early on with this. And it carried over to the WWE championship after the fact, even many years later, when rock came back from Hollywood, they had a little face off backstage. The, the audience erupted for it. Um, I think that people do remember it for me, at least it was a big part of the attitude era. Cause right underneath Steve and Mr. McMahon, you had that rock triple H deal rumbling the entire time. Hey, Hey, it's Conrad Thompson here to tell you a little more about what adfreeshows.com is all about. Get early ad free access to more than a dozen of your favorite wrestling podcasts every single week, starting at just nine bucks. That's less than 20 cents an episode each month. And yes, you can listen to them all directly through Apple podcasts or your regular podcast apps. How easy is that? Ad free shows also has thousands of hours worth of bonus content and docu-series like title chase, Eric fires back conversations with Conrad and the insiders plus new series like the book with David Crockett, Monday mailbags with Mike Kyoto and Nick Patrick and a whole lot more. And you want to talk about early. You can't get any earlier than listening to the shows live. You can be a part of the live studio audience as we record the podcast. Plus ride shotgun alongside your favorite childhood heroes for live watch alongs, Q and A's and other interactive experiences every single month. Come on now, see for yourself what thousands of other wrestling fans from around the world have discovered that adfreeshows.com is the best value in wrestling. Check it out today. And Hey, when you do the first week is completely free Adfreeshows.com. free shows.com.